out throughout the ends of the earth and is not going to return void. But Lord, it's going to accomplish its purpose. And Lord, I declare the word that you've placed in every person in this room. This word that you placed on everybody listening online is not going to return void. It's going to accomplish its purpose. Lord, your people are going to be like date palms flourishing in the courts of their God, bearing fruit even in the old age, and every part of them will be useful and their leaf will not wither. Lord, I ask as this word is released today, may the third level anointing come over your people today. Lord, an anointing to break loose and break free, Lord God. Lord, an anointing to begin to walk as we've never walked before. Lord, an anointing, God, to see things happen that we've never seen happen before. Lord, I thank you that we're about to see the greatest days of the church come forth, Lord God. Hallelujah. As the people falls more in love with you than we've ever been before, Lord Jesus. And we lift you up to be the first thing. Lord, as we do the things that we once did before. And Lord, I thank you. Everything is going to change. Lord, we ask you today for a greater than Azusa Street anointing to come. Lord, we ask today, God, that a breaker anointing will come forth. Lord, we ask today that a power will be poured out upon this house that's of you, Lord God, that we've never seen before. Because, Lord Jesus, you said in Habakkuk 1, I'm about to do something in your generation that you've never seen me do before. And if I told you, you'd have a hard time believing it. Lord, then in chapter 2, you said in the revelation awaits an appointed time. Lord, I thank you now is the time for all things to be revealed. For it's the glory of God to conceal the matter. It's the glory of King to search it out for you are making all things new for you are unlaying oh, oh whew, lord you are uncovering things and laying them bare lord you're shouting from the rooftops the things that have been done in secret and lord i thank you in this hour you are releasing an intimacy with your people like your people have never known before lord i thank you right now for the angels Lord, that are around your throne, the holy seraphim, Lord, the four. Oh, whoo, hallelujah. Lord, the seraphim are around That's your so throne, hard. that all they do is say, holy, holy, holy oh, is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. Oh. Let's say that right now with me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. Lord, I ask today that the glory of the Lord will come forth from this house. Lord, I hear you say I'm making all things new. Lord, I hear you say you're making springs of the deserts. Lord, I hear you saying that the pine tree is going to grow where only the thorn bush once grew. Lord, I thank you that you're saying, hallelujah, that you're the irresistible force that's about to hit the immovable objects in your people's lives and blow them out of the way. Lord, I thank you, God, that I hear you saying, I'm coming back soon, says the Lord. Be wise virgins in this hour and make yourselves ready. For I'm coming like a thief in the night. No man knows the day or the hour. Oh, but you can know the season, says the Lord. Look at everything that's going on around you and you will see that I'm coming back soon. Make yourself ready. Make yourself ready. Make yourself ready, says the Lord. Be like the five wise virgins in this hour. And Lord, I thank you. You're opening up the ears of your people right now. Lord, we're going to hear things that we've never heard uttered before from the spirit realm. Lord, we're going to hear decrees from your throne that we've never heard before. Lord, I thank you, God, that you're moving us out of a place of mixture and into a place of being set apart for you. For Lord, you said to a people without mixture, I'll pour out my power beyond measure. Lord, everything that you are, everything that you have for us, everything that you want to do in this hour, Lord, we say yes and amen to it. Lord, help us stand firm until the end so that we'll receive the crown of life that we can throw at your feet. Lord Jesus, you are Sozo. You are Zoe. Salvation is your name, Lord Jesus. For there's no other name under heaven given to men by which they can be saved. But the name! The name of Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you are holy, holy, 
holy. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive all glory, all honor, all power, all dominion. Worthy is the Lamb. Lord, I pray now, may we, who you have destined to rule and reign with you for all of eternity, may we fall so in love with you here on this earth, Lord, that we begin to subdue it, Lord, and prepare it for your return. Father, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is where you dwell. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. As the lights come on this morning, how many are excited about Jesus? Okay, maybe I'm the only one. All right. How many are excited about Jesus? Amen. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Mm. This morning I want to talk about the next level anointing. <laughs> the next level anointing. How many are ready for the next level of anointing to come upon you? Amen? And I just declare as this word is released, that next level anointing is going to be released by the Spirit of the living God. Roha Kodesh, the breath of God in this place. How many receive that in the Lord? So Lord Jesus, I just ask that you will remove from anybody that's going to hear this word anything that would block, that would resist that would come against the release of the Holy Spirit that's going to come in this word. Lord God, we tear down strongholds and everything that exalts itself above your word. And Lord God, right now, I just decree a release from the throne of the living God, from the throne of Yah upon this place. Lord, I speak an anointing to open up ears so that they can hear. An anointing in the Lord Jesus to open up eyes so that they can see. And Lord, an anointing to open up our mouths Lord, so that we can receive uh, uh, the goodness of God. Lord, you said, open up your mouth and I will fill it. <laughs> Lord, we open up our mouths to you today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said. Amen. Amen. I'm excited about this word this morning. Because as God was giving me this word, his presence was just flowing all over me in a mighty way. And I know if God's going to do that for me, he's going to do that for you. Amen? Right. Hallelujah. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 10. This morning, God wants to show us something that we've never seen before. Are you ready in the Lord? Amen. Amen. Let me ask that again. Are you ready in the Lord? Yes. Woo! Hallelujah. I love it. Sister Shanta's already standing up. When you get 1 Samuel chapter 2, let's stand before the Lord. Why do we stand here at the refuge when the first uh, passage is read in the message? We do so to honor Jesus because he's the word made flesh. Amen? Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Hallelujah. So we're talking today about the next level anointing. And God wants to release that next level anointing over his people. Can I hear an amen? amen. Oh, hallelujah. I want you to notice what the word of God says. Woo, somebody bless the Lord. Woo, hallelujah. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. Now that word horn in the Hebrew doesn't mean a literal horn that we would blow like a shofar before the Lord. It literally means strength. So Hannah is saying as she blesses God because God's done a miracle. He's opened up her spiritual, her womb, not only in the physical, but in the spiritual, because God is going to give her a child that God is going to use to change a generation. Can I hear an amen? amen? Hallelujah. I just decree and declare God's opening up spiritual wounds right now to receive in the name of Jesus. She said, my mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in in your deliverance. Amen. How many know that God is releasing deliverance over his people? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. For she says, there is no one holy like the Lord. There's no one beside you. There's no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds are weighed. Can I hear an Amen. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumble are armed with strength. Woo! How many know in, his, in our weakness he is strong? Yes. Those who are full hire themselves up, out for mm. Woo! Those who are full hire themselves out for food, but those who are hunger, hungry hunger no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, and she who has had many sons pines away. 
Whoa. How many know at this point, Hannah hadn't had seven children? <laughs> but she was speaking to that which was not as if it was, and God was going to bring it forth. Can I hear an amen? Now notice her perspective on the Lord. Verse 6. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and He raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and He exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He, set, he seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. That's us. Amen. Amen. We who knew no husband, He became our husband. Right. We who had nothing, He lifted us up to rule and reign with Him. Amen? Hallelujah. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's, and upon them He has set the world. Notice this promise, church, in verse 9. He will guard the feet of His saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heaven and He will judge the ends of the earth. Now notice the end of what we're about to read in verse 10. Verse 10 part B. He will give strength to His King and He will exalt the horn of His anointed. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen? Now how many in this room are His anointed? Amen? amen? amen. Hallelujah. Alright, anointed of God, please be seated. Hallelujah. Now in this house, if you're new to this house, and even if you've been a part of this house for a number of seasons, I want to remind you of something. Here in this house, we are a spirit and word people. We want to keep this in mind. In many denominations, you find denominations that are all about the word, but oh, we're a little nervous about the spirit. I mean, if we give the Holy Spirit freedom, somebody can end up barking like a dog in the corner. How many know the Holy Spirit doesn't do that? Amen. 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 That Holy that is not Holy Spirit. What that is is man's fear of giving control over to the Holy Spirit. Come on now. So what does man do? We just kind of equate this to some wild thing that could happen. God's not like that. That's right. That's not who he right. is. Amen. Then there's a lot of denominations that, that, that love the Holy Spirit, but don't press into the word the way that they should. Amen. I believe when we're a spirit and a word people, we're balanced. Ooh, has anybody received that in the Lord? Yes. Amen. The, the charismatic Catholics in the area who who were part of a revival in the Catholic Church in the 1970s in this area. The, 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 the diocese gave them their own priest and, and, and their own building. And they said one night they were praying and the whole building shook at the foundations. Woo, hallelujah. That group used to say too much word and you dry up. Too much spirit and you blow up. Spirit and the word and you grow up. Hallelujah. How many receive that in the Lord? And I really believe in this season God is calling his people into balance. Not man's balance, but God's balance. Amen. And let me say this. God's balance will always look unbalanced to man. Right. Because man isn't going to understand that. Why do you spend so much time with the Lord? Why do you spend so much time at church? Why do you spend so much time doing this? Why do you spend so much time doing that? I just don't understand. You're not who you used to be. Amen. Hallelujah! Hey. Glory! And as we come near to the return of the Lord, God is going to ask His people for more time. Yeah. Why is that? Why is He going to ask His people for more of their time? Because He's preparing us for eternity. What do you think we're going to do in eternity? We are going to be in the Lord's presence forevermore. Amen. How many receive that in the Lord? We're going to worship Him from the crystal sea. We're going to study His Word even in eternity. There are revelations God has yet to reveal from His Word in this, for this generation. Hallelujah! And for eternity with Him. I'm going to say it again. I believe eternity with the Lord is going to be a series of woes. I mean, He's going to reveal something new to us 10,000 years in that we never knew about Him and you're going to hear, whoa! And then a million years in, He's going to reveal something else about us that we didn't know about Him. That's going to cause us to fall more in love with Him than we've ever been before. Even a million years in, and we're going to go, whoa! I believe eternity is going to be like that in the Lord, amen? amen. But God doesn't want eternity to be relegated to the time that's coming. Because my Bible says in the book of Hebrews, there's a people that have tasted of the power of the age to come. 
What is God wanting his people to do? Stand on the bridge of faith and pull the atmosphere of the third heaven, the atmosphere of eternity into the earth. Has anybody received that? And they're going to stand in a radical faith and they're not going to say, mm. they're going to say, we're not satisfied with the way the church is in our generation. Amen. They're going to say, we're not satisfied with denominationalism. Amen. We're not satisfied with religion. We're not Amen. satisfied with sensationalism. Amen. We want the unhindered, undiluted Jesus. Amen. We won't be seeker sensitive. We'll be spirit sensitive. We won't water down the word. We'll be full gospel. There is a radical people being raised up. Do you receive? Do you receive that in the Lord today? So what does the Lord say here in the last part of verse 10? 1 Samuel 2, uh, verse 10, the Lord says, He will give strength to His King. How many kings are in this house right now? What does the Lord say? He's the King of kings. Who are the kings that He's the King of? The Lord says we're a royal priesthood, a holy generation, and the Lord is giving strength to His kings in this hour. Why is He giving them strength? Because we're going to need strength to stand firm in the hour that is coming. David said, oh, hallelujah, that this one thing do I desire, this one thing do I seek. Lord, to see your beauty, hallelujah. He's wanting to become the one thing in the lives of his people once again. As we said last week, he's calling us to go back and do the things that we once did. Yet in the midst of that, as we're turning to our first love, he is going to do things we've never seen him do before. Do you receive that in the Lord? So what's he doing? He's strengthening his people. Daniel said, in the time of the end when the days are darkest, even in the midst of that will be a people who will know their God and they'll do mighty exploits. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So what's he doing right now? He's calling you deeper into the secret place. Don't be surprised if you go to turn on a movie and he says, no, get in my presence. Don't be surprised when you get ready to do something you want to go do. And he goes, no, stay here and sit with me. I want to share things with you you've never heard me say before. Amen? Family's not going to understand it. People around you aren't going to understand it. We've got to stop thinking that people that walk in the flesh will understand the things of the Spirit. Why do we do that? Why do we beat our heads and go, why don't they understand? Because we're beating our heads. When the Holy Spirit saying, don't expect them to understand. You just be who you're supposed to be in this hour and they'll begin to understand through your life and what I manifest in it. Do you receive that in the Lord? Amen? So we're a spirit and word people. So in the spirit and word church, you know, there's, there's terms that we use that we kind of assume everybody is familiar with. You know, my, my amazing wife, Miss Holly, just the most incredible woman on this earth that I absolutely love. Hallelujah, isn't she amazing? Yes. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. You know, and when I met her, she was a shy little conservative Lutheran girl. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory. And then the Holy Ghost got a hold of her. Glory. And I tell you what, who she is now was not who we met seven years ago. Amen, Pastor Cindy. I mean, hallelujah, dancing, screaming, shouting, speaking in tongues, loving the word. I come home from work, she's listening to a teaching. I go to work, she's listening to a teaching. I mean, hallelujah, she's just in love with Jesus, with the word, and with the Holy Spirit. But you know, when, when she came to the house, we used terms she never heard before. And she'd have to come to me and she goes, well, what's this? You know, and what's that? And what's this? How many know that's good? Because that's the way we learn. Yeah. We ask questions. I ask questions of the Holy Spirit all the time. Yeah. What's this? <laughs> what does this mean? How does that work? I ask him the same exact questions. Amen. But, but in the church, spirit-filled church, we use terms like the anointing, manifestation, the glory, God's presence, the anointing that breaks the yoke. Can I hear an amen? amen. And, and these are terms we're familiar with because God's taken to us, taken us to a place that we've always wanted to go to. Amen? But the thing is, all these terms like the anointing, the presence, the glory, we kind of use them synonymously. We use them like they all mean the same thing. But if we study them in the Hebrew and then in the Greek, we begin to understand that they all have their own unique meaning. And God, and how do you know God's taking His people back to the Hebrew? God is taking His people back to the Greek. If you're listening right now to anyone who is flowing and an anointing and preaching and teaching, they're bringing in the Hebrew and the Greek because God's revealing things out of the Hebrew to His Gentile church that we've never known before. 
meanings of words, meanings of tradition, revelation that's there that we've never understood because many times the Gentile church has a Greek mindset. And God is wanting us to take us out of the Greek mindset and into the Hebrew mindset. Does that make sense to anybody in the room? Amen. Amen. So I love the anointing of the Lord. When I was 18 years old, I was a rebellious pastor's kid. My dad forced me to go to youth group one night. I was probably in trouble for something, and he probably said, Son, you know, if you go to church tonight, you know, uh, you, you won't have to, you know, take this punishment. I'll be honest, that was probably what it was. So I went to church that night. I thought it was the path of least resistance. Youth group was going on that night. It was a Wednesday night. And there was a couple in our church, a young couple filled with the Holy Spirit, loved the Word of God, and, and ministered in power and anointing. And that night at the end of youth group, they prayed over me and I went out in the Spirit for the very first time. Oh, hallelujah. And while I was out in the Spirit, I heard the wife prophesy. She said, and you will know me and I will know you, says the Lord. And even though it would have been a number of years before I really, really gave my heart to the Lord, in that time, God began to do a move in me, a work in me, and that seed that was planted that night was not going to return back to the Lord void. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here today. I also had a praying dad and a praying mom and a praying grandmother. Can I hear an amen? amen. How many know the fervent and effectual prayer of the righteous availeth much? So I love the anointing of the Lord. Part of the reason why I'm not in the Southern Baptist arena anymore is because I love the anointing of the Lord. Hallelujah. It's a little bit much. For the Southern Baptist Church, but you know what? I want all of Jesus. Amen. 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 What the Lord say to Israel coming out of Egypt? Eat the whole lamb. Amen. Amen. And we need to eat of every bit of who He is. So it's interesting if we look at that word anointing. So there's anoint, anointed, anointed, and anointing and anointest in the word. If we look at it in the Word of God, the word anoint is used 35 times. Wow. In the Word of God, the word anointed is used 98 times. In the Word of God, the word anointing is used 28 times. And the word anointest is used one time. As in, thou anointest my head with oil and my cup overflows. Amen? All together, the word anointing and variations of the word anointing are used 162 times in the Word of God. So how do you know that something that's mentioned 162 times in the Word of God is important for God's people? Amen. When God speaks it over and over and over again, we've got to pay attention to it. Can I hear an amen? amen? And I praise God that I'm speaking to you here today, teaching today in the anointing of the Lord in the year 2021 in the new covenant of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Why is that? Because the old covenant was a covenant of visitation. The new covenant is a covenant of habitation. Can I hear an amen? So in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God came upon people. But how many know in the new covenant, the Spirit of God dwells within us? Amen. Do you receive that in the Lord? Yeah. And I don't think we ever need to be in a service where somebody needs healing or deliverance or a prophetic word or anything like that. And, 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 and have to do this. Lord, I just pray that the anointing will come. God, we need a healing. I pray that your anointing will fall. The anointing is already here. Amen. The anointing is within you. Amen. And God's called you to walk in the fivefold ministry. At any time, He may want you to prophesy. At any time, He may want you to teach. At any time, come on, church, He may want you to share the gospel. God's called you to walk in the fivefold. God's called me to walk in the fivefold. And if you're under this ministry, then you're under the flow of the fivefold. That's why you want to be careful who you submit yourself under. Because the anointing flows. It starts at the head. Come on now, receive this. This is more teaching today, right? Woo. Blessed is the place where brothers dwell together in unity. It's like the oil, the precious oil poured down Aaron's head down his beard, come on, into the collar of his robes. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, his life, his presence forevermore. Psalm 133. How does the oil flow? It flows downward. 
So the person that you are under as a servant shepherd, that anointing flows. That's why I ask you to pray for me. That God will bring me into a greater level of anointing because as I come into it, you come into it because we come into it together as one body. Does that make sense? That's also why if you speak against your pastor, that flows down also. Come on. Hallelujah. So let's speak life. Amen. Hallelujah. This is teaching today in the Lord. You receive that. So the anointing is used or variations thereof 162 times in the word of God. How many receive that in the Lord? So if God mentions the anointing 162 times. There must be something significant about the oil. Can I hear an amen? About the anointing of God. Because the oil represents the anointing of God. How many know that we can go grab some anointing oil, pray over it, pray over somebody, and I mean, there's a release of the Lord. But how many know that He's the God over the oil? <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. We use the, the oil to anoint people because the Word says, is anyone sick? Let them go to the elders of the church. They'll get the oil. Can I hear an amen? amen. Hallelujah. But we've, we've grabbed, hallelujah, vegetable oil and prayed over it. Hallelujah. Dedicated to the Lord and prayed over somebody and bam, God healed them. How do they know that he's the God of the oil? Amen. You receive that in the Lord? Amen. Now it's interesting in the word that Jesus is Messiah. Can I hear an amen? amen. Have you ever heard him called the anointed one? Do you know why he's called the anointed one? Because Messiah in Hebrew is Masach. And Masach literally means to smear with oil. Isn't that interesting? So that's where we get the term Messiah. Messiah is the one who was smeared with oil. Is that not beautiful in the Lord? That's why they call him the anointed one. He came with the oil. Amen. He came walking in the anointing. Jesus is being baptized by John in obedience to the Father to fulfill the word of God. Amen. He gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. The anointing descends upon him like a dove. Has anybody received that in the Lord? Now, how many know when we're saved, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God, come to take up residence within us? Amen. The fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily within us. Then we get baptized with water in obedience to the word, which we're going to do tonight at Pelly Road Christian Fellowship. Is anybody excited about that? Yes. Amen. Yes. <laughs> but how many know as we're baptized with water, there's another baptism, right. and it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes. One baptism, many fillings. Right. And we talked about the fact last week that you may have your initial baptism in the Holy Spirit, but then the Holy Spirit will baptize you again and, and baptize you with an anointing you didn't walk in in the first time you were baptized. Mm -hmm. And then you know, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and anoint you again in another service and something else will manifest that you didn't walk in in the other two anointings. Amen. Well, Pastor, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Well, it's scriptural, so it's in the Bible, so you should be comfortable That's with right. it. Amen. Acts chapter 2, they're in the upper room. Hallelujah. And the Spirit of living God comes upon them. And what's the manifestation? They speak in different tongues. But then in Acts chapter 2, that same group is together. There's another outpouring of the Spirit. And now they go out and preach the gospel in boldness. We can keep on going. Amen. We talk about the baptism at Cornelius' house. I mean, we can go on and on and on with this. There's one baptism of the Holy Spirit, but many fillings. Aren't you glad Holy Ghost doesn't just baptize us once? Amen. And you can be going through different seasons in your life and have baptism encounters with the Holy Spirit where He releases things in those seasons that you need specifically for that season. Amen. Sometimes He'll do it at the beginning of the season, sometimes in the middle of the season, sometimes at the end of the season, but He is God and His timing is perfect. Yes. And we need to, as the people of God, not only seek relationship with Jesus, not only seek relationship with the Father, but we need to also seek relationship with Holy Ghost, yes. with Holy Spirit. Yes. And Holy Spirit is not an it. Holy Spirit is Holy Spirit. 
I've heard people talking about, boy, it was just great today, wasn't it? What's, what's, what's it? We're talking about a person of the Godhead. We're talking about Holy Spirit. I don't even call Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit because that's very formal. I love Holy Ghost. I call Holy Spirit Holy Spirit. Amen? And every time we're together, the Spirit of the living God wants to flow. In the Old Testament, when God breathes life into Adam, the word for breathe was Roha Kodesh. That's a name for the Holy Spirit in Hebrew, meaning the very breath of God. Yes. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah. Glory. That's why in a service, if Holy Spirit is in here, we need to stop the service. Yeah. And we need to cry out and find out why Holy Spirit isn't here. Right. Have we breathed Holy Spirit? Did we go right when Holy Spirit said go left? What happens? See, we're a spirit-led yeah. church. We're not seeker-sensitive. We're spirit-sensitive. Yeah. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Yeah. And right now, Holy Spirit is leading us into all truth. So if we're listening to Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit's preparing us for the time that is coming. Amen. Do you know recently in Indonesia, there was a 6.0 level earthquake? 6.0. When's the last time you heard of a 6.0 level earthquake? on the scale of earthquakes. What does that mean? God's coming back soon. There's another one very recently, I believe this weekend in California is 3.6. How many know that we're watching Matthew 24 lived out in front of us right now? So the word says no one knows the day or the hour, but we can know the season. Remember Jesus goes to the Pharisees and he says you can look at the sun the night before and you'll know what the weather is going to be the next day but you don't understand the signs of the times Amen. and I've got a problem with that the Lord said how do you know we're seeing the signs of the times God is raising up the five wise virgins in this hour he says I want you to go in the secret place and cultivate the oil of intimacy with me I want your wick trimmed I want your lamp full I want extra jars of oil and I want your lamp burning I want you ready when your bridegroom Amen. returns Amen. Amen. What do you say? Behold, wow. I don't know how much of this the Lord's going to let me preach. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. He's just taking us in another direction. He says, but thank you, Holy Spirit. He says, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. The very same thing that the Hebrew bridegroom would say to his bride after the engagement. But he said, I'm going to come back in my father's house for many rooms. The Hebrew bridegroom would go to his father's house and literally build an extension on the house. This is Hebrew culture. And he would build the extension on the house and during that entire time his father would help him build it and would teach him how to be a husband. And this is fascinating. The Hebrew bridegroom could not go and get his bride when the house was done. He had to wait for his father to release him to go get his bride. And as he came back, she had one responsibility and that was to have her lamp burning in the window waiting for his return. How many know that that's the responsibility of the church right now in this age? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So as we're talking about the anointing, in the Old Testament, there were three groups that were anointed. Prophets, priests, and kings. Now I want you to understand something here. The very first man that we see walking in that threefold anointing in the Word of God is David. David's name in the Hebrew means beloved of God. How many know that David was a physical person, but he was a type? He was a picture of a generation that was going to come that walked as prophet, priest, and king. That is this generation. Do you receive that in the Lord? When Jesus came, he walked in that same anointing as prophet, priest, and king. What are we supposed to be walking in today? The anointing of the prophet, priest, and king. We are to be ruling and reigning here on earth as kings. We're to be releasing the word of God as spoken by the Holy Spirit. And we are to be intercessors standing between the earth and the third heaven on our knees interceding on God's behalf and on behalf of the man. How many received that in the Lord? You have a prophet, priestly, and kingly ministry. All three groups in the Old Covenant were anointed with oil. And anointing with oil was not what we see it today. I get accused of liking to use a lot of oil. I'll take that. Jesus is the Messiah. That works for me. I identify with him. When the Holy Ghost hits me, he doesn't give me just a little bing of oil. You know, I'm going to come upon you. Bing. No, he comes upon me and whoosh. Hallelujah. So they would take an animal horn. I can't make this up. 
This is in the Word. And they would hollow it out and they would fill it with oil. They would fill it with oil. Now imagine if the shofar was filled with oil and then dumped on your head. Can you imagine the amount of oil that would flow? Now in the Old Covenant, the oil came from the olive. It was from the blood of the olive. Olives were precious in the Hebrew culture. Can I hear it? Amen. amen. Now when they harvested the olive, they would crush the olive to harvest the oil from the olive. That is a spiritual principle. The oil doesn't flow unless the olive is crushed. Yes. There's going to be some holy breaking in the Lord for you to walk in the ministry He's called you to. What does the word say in Isaiah? It pleased the Father to crush him. Why did it please the Father to crush him? Because the Father knew when the olive was crushed, the oil flows. That's why when you go through a breaking, it's not an ending, it's a beginning. Because the oil is going to flow in your life like never before. The olive, though, is not crushed only one time. In Israel, when the olive is crushed, it's crushed multiple times. There's seven crushings of the olive. Isn't that interesting? The Hebrew number of completion. The very first press of the olive creates the most rich oil. And in Israel, the first press of the olive was used primarily for two purposes. The first was for the burning of the lamp in the temple. And secondly, the first press was used for the anointing oil that anointed the prophets, priests, and kings. Meaning what? When God pours his oil out on you, you don't get second, third, fourth, or fifth press. You get the first press of the oil. And they would pour it out, and it would pour out over the head, down the beard, or ladies, down upon the face, down the body, and would flow down to your feet. But a lot of times the Hebrew men would have cuffs in their garments, and the olive, the, the olive oil would flow. And by the way, it wasn't just olive oil. It was olive oil mixed with frankincense mm -hmm. and myrrh and cinnamon mm -hmm. and other spices. So when a man of God or a woman of God was anointed, you could smell them coming mm -hmm. for days afterwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, there's an anointing that God's pouring out on his people where they will sense someone walking and that anointing is coming. They will smell the fragrance of the knowledge of God on them. They will smell the fragrance of the secret place on them. Is anybody willing to receive this in the Lord? Hallelujah. Why did the woman with the issue of blood believe if she could grab the cup of his garment, she'd be healed? Because when the priest was anointed, the prophet, the king was anointed, that oil would catch in the cuff of the garment. And they believed that's where the anointing was. The talit, they called it. And she knew if she could grab a hold of the talit of his garment, she would be healed. But unlike that woman, there's a generation that's upon the earth right now being raised up by God who will lay a hold of the hem of his garment but not let go. Because they'll realize that he is the source of life. He's the one thing. He's everything they've always wanted. Hallelujah! And they won't let go. Instead of Peter saying, to, when the Lord asks him, who touched me? And Peter saying, Lord, there's, there's thousands of people around you right now. Peter's going to go, the one hanging on right now. is the one hanging on right now. How many know that this generation that's being raised up by the Lord, we're all a part of it. It's not defined by age it's defined by the heart Amen. it's a generation circumcised in the heart god's raising up that generation right now and it's going to be the greatest generation the church has ever known god is going to change the expression of christianity in one generation and we're part of that generation can i hear an amen now it's interesting that word anoint if we go back to the hebrew and remember, it's used 162 times, but there's three primary meanings of the word anoint in the Hebrew. Are you ready with this? Mm -hmm. Number one, it says to, it means to pour out. So when the word says, thou anointest my head with oil, one of those meanings means to pour out. That's the horn being filled up with anointing oil and poured out over someone. Can I hear an amen? Amen. 
Now, the second meaning of it was masak, to smear on or to rub in. Isn't that interesting? But it's interesting because that's very closely related to the third meaning of anoint, which literally means to rub in deeply so that it abides. It's not just in you or on you, it's in you. What's our picture of this? Esther going through a year's worth of beauty treatments, being prepared for the king, and they're literally rubbing oil and perfume into her skin so that it literally becomes part of her. Wow. Come on. So we can pour the anointing, we can smear the anointing, we can rub in the anointing. I don't know about you. Don't pour me. Don't smear me. I want the rubbing in of Jesus in the knee so you don't know where he ends and where I begin. Huh. And isn't it interesting? Esther goes before the king and she captures his heart more than any of the other women that were brought to him in that process. Right now in the secret place, Holy Spirit is rubbing you with oil and Holy Spirit says as He rubs you with oil, that anointing is going to be within you, not upon you. And the Lord says that anointing is going to flow out of you even when you don't realize it. You're just going to walk past people like Peter and your shadow is going to heal them. You're going to walk into a room like Smith Wigglesworth and people three floors up are going to start repenting and bowing down before the Lord. I mean, there is a manifest, oily anointing of God that changes everything. And right now I decree and declare that oil is coming over you, that the angels of the living God are pouring out horns of anointing oil over people in this room. And by the time we're done, there's going to be an anointing like we've never seen before. Can I hear an amen? amen. Now, this is what we need to understand about Jesus' ministry. Because he is the anointed one, the Masak. Can I hear an amen? amen? Jesus was in preparation for 30 years for a three and a half year ministry. Amen. Amen. That's the truth of the word of God. Meaning what? The preparation is every bit as important as the release. Some may argue it's more important than the release. <laughs> and there's so many right now in the church that are crying out, God, the time is short. Release me into my ministry. And the Lord is saying, go deep into the secret place first because I want to rub the anointing oil into your skin. Yeah. I want to rub the frankincense and the myrrh in. But God, you can release it when I step in. God's saying, you can't step in until I release you. Amen. 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 So right now, don't feel like you're shelved. Don't feel like God's forgotten about you. Don't feel like you've sinned to the point where God says, no, you're disqualified. God says, don't let the enemy lie to you like that. I chose you before the foundations of the world. And I chose you knowing every sin you'd ever commit. And knowing as the Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world, I would die to cover those sins. They're in the sea of forgetfulness. Don't go fishing. Amen. 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 Wow. Glory. Glory. Spoken, so shall it be. Amen. So, what is God saying? God is saying, You're not shelved, you're being prepared. You're being prepared. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Amen. So, Jesus is prepared 30 years for a three and a half year ministry. Does anybody receive that in the Lord? Now, let's go to Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. I want to read this from Luke. How many love the Word of God? Amen. 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 What is how does Jesus get released into his ministry? Well, we would all say, well, it, it, it happens, it happened when he was baptized, right? Well, wait a minute. <laughs> that was preparation and obedience. Do you know what his ministry really started? When he stepped into the synagogue in his hometown and he opened up a scroll from the book of Isaiah, and he did what? He began to read about himself. Now, right. <laughs> number one, let me be transparent and make a statement. I'm jealous. <laughs> Why am I jealous? Because one day in Nazareth, the Word of God walked into the synagogue and read the Word of God. <laughs> he is the Word made flesh, John 1. Amen. 
So you had the Word of God reading the Word of God. Now, think about this. My mind does these things. So bear with me, all right? If God calls you here, you're really going to have to bear with it. Because this is the way my mind thinks. So the Word of God who was before the foundations of the world were ever laid. The Word of God that always was, who is now the Word of God made flesh, is now reading the Word of God, prophesied by Isaiah, a word that was a word before the world was ever created, but being fulfilled at that very moment. Oh my God. <laughs> Connect those dots. And a word that has yet to be fulfilled and will continue to be fulfilled for all of eternity. That's mind-boggling. I mean, that goes beyond if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around, does anyone really hear it, right? And that just blows that away. So here is Jesus reading the Word of God. Can you imagine the anointing that was in the room as the Word of God read the Word of God, as it was being fulfilled at that very moment? Which is a picture. We are in a time where God is speeding things up. And the time from the release of the Word to the fulfillment of the Word is going like this. In that very moment in that synagogue, Jesus spoke the Word and it was fulfilled at that very moment. The Word that was spoken before the beginning of time and is still being spoken today. My God, my God, my God. Woo. Now do you see why I said I'm jealous? <laughs> now the Word of God is amazing, isn't it? Now, I want you to notice what the Word of God says. I'm in the end of Luke 4, verse 18. Now, the Lord is reading from the book of Isaiah. Can I hear an amen? Isaiah 61. But I want you to know he's reading per Luke in, in Luke 4, 18. Jesus stands up. Because at that time in the temple, anybody could stand up and read from the scroll. We don't know if Jesus had ever been released by the Father to do that until this moment. I question whether he was, because as the Word of God read the word of God, he was brought into his ministry. When the word of God becomes a part of you, to where you don't know where the word ends and you begin, he'll bring you into your ministry. When the word of God is made flesh in you, is made manifest in you, it's time for your ministry. Does that make sense to anybody in the room? Listen with the ears of the spirit. He says in verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. You know, he could have said it this way. I am the Spirit of the Lord. Okay. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. And by the way, this is your anointing also. And I declare as I speak it, you're receiving it. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Can I hear an amen? Amen. You know, I think at that very moment, because he, he read the word with such power and authority, and depth and eternity, Solomon said, you put eternity in the hearts of men. Eternity was reading his word. Could you imagine what happened in that room as he did that? The very one who spoke previously, let there be light, and it was. Let there be land, and it was. Now is reading the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Can you imagine, church? And now every eye is upon him. And I want you to notice what the word says. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Ah. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Hallelujah. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. You see, when the word becomes a part of you, when the spirit becomes a part of you, and you learn how to flow in the word and in the spirit and start disconnecting from the flesh, what comes out of you will be from the third heaven, not from your own flesh. And with people, when people hear it, they're going to be amazed. Yes, yes. And they're going to say, who is this? And don't be surprised if they don't say, isn't this Gene? Looks like Gene, but it's not Gene anymore. It's the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, crucified, risen, and manifesting through his bride. That's what it is. 
Does that make sense? And Ellen, God says He wanted to make sure you are here for this word today. Receive this word in the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, I want to show you something that's interesting here. You've probably read this so many times before. But how many know God is revealing to us things from the Hebrew that we've never known before? Amen? If we go back to Luke chapter 4, in, in verse 19, the word says, To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Somebody say, To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Do you know what that year is to the Hebrews, to the Jews? Because many times when Jesus taught, he spoke the language of the Jews. We can't forget we have a Jewish king. And he spoke things to the Jews that we read in English and go, oh yeah, that's really good. But the Jews really understood what he was saying and they went, whoa, wait a minute. When he said the acceptable year of the Lord, the acceptable year of the Lord to Israel was the year of Jubilee. It was the year of Jubilee. I want you to understand this. Jubilee happened every 50 years in Israel. Jesus said, I'm here to proclaim the year of Jubilee. Now I want you to think about this. They were under Roman reign at the time. They were oppressed. Rome was right there in the middle of Jerusalem. It was a difficult time. They were waiting for Messiah and they waited for generations and people were giving up and the Lord stood up and said, I proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I proclaim Jubilee. What did he really say? I am Jubilee. Now what is Jubilee? It was the year that anyone that was sold into slavery gained their freedom. It was the year where anyone who sold their land gained it back. It was the year where things that you had lost were returned to you. You know what Jesus was saying? I'm bringing my people into Jubilee. He said as Messiah, as Masak, I am Jubilee. Which means what? When we are saved and Masak is in us, he brings us into a lifelong process of Jubilee. Restoring back to us what the enemy has stolen and the locusts and canker worm have eaten and that has been stolen from our ancestors all the way back to Adam and Eve. He is Jubilee. Has anybody received that in the Lord? What was Jesus really saying? I've come to deliver you. I've come to set you free. I've come to heal you. I've come to bless you. Amen. You know, in the word, there's 16 Jehovah names. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Sid Canoe. We can keep going. There's 16 Jehovah names. You know what Jesus was really saying there? I am Jubilee and I am all 16 Jehovah names manifesting right now in your presence. Do you need healing? I'm here. Do you need prosperity? I am here. Do you need deliverance? I am here. Do you need restoration? I am here. And that same Jesus who is Jubilee is here right now with us. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when that Jesus walks into a room with you, Jubilee enters that room. I don't care if you're at the county jail. I don't care if you walk into a crack house. I don't care if you walk into the church house or into the bank. I don't care if you're walking into a grocery store, Walmart. I don't care where if you walk into a movie theater. When you walk in, Jubilee walks in with you. When are we truly going to begin to visualize who we really are in Christ? Amen. When that begins to happen, everything's going to change. Can I hear an amen? amen. All right. Now, I, I want you to understand something that's, that's, that's very interesting here in Luke chapter 4. Because I want to talk now about the next level anointing. <laughs> the next level anointing. Whatever anointing level you're at in the Lord right now, I have a word from God for you. There's a next level anointing. Hallelujah. Because in season after season after season, God wants to take you to the next level anointing. Remember the dream I told you I had that had my mom in it? Anybody remember that? And I had to go up the levels to get to her. 
Come on. God says we're about to go up the levels. But the higher the levels, the bigger the devils. So we got to realize you get on that next level, you start fighting something going, wait, wait a minute, I thought I fought this before. I thought it was dumb. The Lord says, no, you weren't dumb. You just fought it on the previous level and got victory over it. Now you're going to get victory over it on this new level. Amen? So don't be surprised. Well, wait a minute, God, I thought we dealt with this. Well, we dealt with that on its level. Mm-hmm. Now you're going to a new level. We're going to deal with new things. There's going to be war at the door to that new level. Amen. But if there's no war, then there's nothing of significance on the other side. Amen. But when the devil meets you with war, it means there's something eternal hanging in the balance because he comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. If there's nothing worth it, of significant eternal value, he doesn't waste his time. That's why when you're just messing around, playing around with the things of God, cold as Laodicea, not really caring, there wasn't a whole lot of interference there. You know, there's some difficult things, but there wasn't a whole lot of interference there. You just kind of went along seemingly happy go lucky. <laughs> but then when God, when you really got excited about the things of God and really started to press in, you may have gotten a honeymoon, but then what came? The warfare! And we asked somebody, hey brother, how you doing? Oh, I'm going through warfare. Whoa, did you just say break through? <laughs> Whoa, is that what you said? Because I think when we're on one side of the equation of maturity in the things of the Lord, it's warfare. But I think when we step to the next level, we realize it's breakthrough. Amen. 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 Yeah. The angels are in the room scribing right now. Those of you, those of you that just clapped, they went, okay, uh-huh. Uh-huh. all right, <laughs> yeah, okay, all right, they got that. First comes the knowledge, then comes the test. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How many are enjoying this word? Amen. So Luke chapter 4, verse 18, going back to Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news of the gospel. Now here's the question. If we take that into the Greek, does it mean to pour out, to smear on, or to rub in? Which version of the word anoint did Jesus use? I want you to think about it in your mind right now. It was the third to rub into. What was he really saying? I am so surrendered to the will of the Father and in love with Him and intimate with Him the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is rubbed into me to preach the good news to the gospel, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to set at liberty those who... Is anybody getting the picture? It was rubbed into him like Esther. Because don't you think when Esther walked by, you went, whoa, 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 what's that? Wait till that starts happening to you when you walk through Walmart. And the anointing of God is so massaged in you. One of two, before you laugh, keep this in mind. One of two things is going to happen. Some folks are going to go, Hallelujah! And other, others are going to go, Why have you come to torment us before the appointed time, Jesus? Amen. We're the fragrance of Christ. To one, we're the fragrance of life. To the other, we're the stench of death. Who is equal to such a task? So you've got to understand, you start walking in the manifest presence, things are going to manifest. Yes. Yes. You're walking the manifestation that brings manifestation. How many receive that in the Lord? So the word that he used there is Masak. Is anybody excited about the Lord? It means to rub in. What was it? The anointed he needed in that season to fulfill the will of the Father. What's God pouring out on you in the season? The anointing that you need to fulfill his will for your life in the season. Here's our problem. We look at somebody who we view as highly anointed and we go, I want it, I want it, I want that anointing, I want that anointing. Number one, we don't realize how crushed they had to be in order to walk in that. And number two, we've got to realize that what we need to pray is, Lord, give me the masak that I need to fulfill your will in this season. Lord, I refuse to look three seasons down the road and ask for that anointing because that anointing comes with multiple levels of crushing. That anointing comes with greater maturity. That anointing comes as you've gotten the me out of me. And God, I'm not really ready for that. Can I have the anointing necessary for this season, please? This is some deep stuff God's taken us into today. 
Amen. Stop looking at four levels of anointing down the road and going, I want it. Just want Jesus right now. Amen. And want what he wants right now and the anointing to get you through the right now. Because if you don't get through the right now successfully, you're not going to get to the three right nows from right now. Amen. <laughs> Does that make sense to anybody in the room? We'll chart that out later. Okay. All right. So this is interesting. Holy Spirit comes over Jesus as he's being baptized in the Jordan. Can I hear an amen? amen. He's the Masak. He's the anointed one. We have not seen an anointing like that since the days of David. Why? Because David was a type. He was a picture of Christ. Now grab all this. I'm not saying David was Christ. I'm saying he was a type. He was a picture. Amen? But please keep that in mind. Don't, don't email me and say, Pastor, what were you saying? No, I'm saying he was a type. See, we saw Daniels who walked in, in deep mm, surrender to God. We saw Jeremiah's who prophesied. We saw Samuel's who were prophet priests. We saw men and women who were pieces of what was to come. David was prophet, priest, and king. He walked in all three. Many of the others just walked in one fold of that anointing. David walked in all three. He was king over all of Israel. His psalms are incredibly prophetic. Yes. And he was a priest before the Lord. There was more than one occasion he'd throw on the, the, the linen garment of the priest. Yeah. He and his companions went into the Holy of Holies and ate the showbread, mm -hmm. and God had no problem with it. David is a picture of the generation that's on the earth right now that will walk as prophet, priests, and kings. And God's going to let them do things that he wouldn't let other generations do because they're going to be in a place with him that other generations weren't. I mean, Saul gets in big trouble with God for just making a sacrifice. David walks into the Holy of Holies and eats the bread. And God doesn't say a word. Why? Because Saul and David were on completely different levels of intimacy with God. And the higher you go or deeper you go in intimacy with the Lord, the more opens up to you in the realm of the Spirit. Does that make sense? Why did... Why did why did God have no problem with David eating the showbread? Because he was a priest. Saul was just a king. Kings don't make sacrifice. Priests do. Is anybody getting this? See, when you want to go those deeper places and press in the Lord, God lets you do things <laughs> that you weren't allowed to do in previous levels. I don't mean bad things. I mean God things. More becomes available to you. I mean, if you become the CEO of a company, you have a whole lot more available to you than when you were just a supervisor. <laughs> and God says, I'm calling you to deeper levels. And with deeper levels comes a greater unlocking and expression of the realm of the Spirit of God in your life. It's an inward manifestation that will lead to an outward manifestation. Is anybody hearing the Spirit of God in this word today? Okay. Now, I want you to understand when David came on the scene, <laughs> David was a picture of what was to come. Can I hear an amen in the Lord? Amen. I mean, does, does anybody grab a hold of this in him? Okay. <laughs> I was walking with my wife last night. She always gets the message before the message. Because sometimes she's in children's ministry and she doesn't get the word, hear the word directly. So she gets the message before the message. Sometimes she gets the message before the message and she gets the message that is the message. And then she gets the message after the message on the way home. It's a pastor's wife thing. Okay. <laughs> Ladies, if God calls you to it, just understand that's what's going to happen. God starts talking talk to me and he said, Andrew, I want you to understand something about Saul and David. I said, okay. I said, what do you want me to understand? He said this, Saul was man's choice, David was my choice. I said, oh, that's good. He said, Andrew, Saul looked the part, David was the part. I went, oh, that's good. He said, Andrew, he said, Saul represents circumcision of the flesh. David represents circumcision of the heart. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I went, whoa. 
That's really good. He said, Andrew, Saul represents walking in the flesh. David represents walking in the spirit. I said, that's really good. The Lord said, Andrew, Saul represents the Eli priesthood. David represents the Zadok priesthood. Now, that's a whole other message in itself. But in the time in Israel, when all the Eli priests worshipped other gods, the Zadok priesthood stayed faithful to the Lord. And at the end of that period, the Lord said, Zadok priesthood, you will come and minister to me at my table. And then you will take what I give you from my table and you will release it to the people. It was a brand new priesthood. That's why that spirit of David, that in... Seen in the Lord. Whoa. See, that anointing of David wasn't just for David's time. It was for David's time. It was for Jesus' time. And it's for the time of the end. See, the significant anointings have at least a threefold manifestation. And that one does. Take that one into the Spirit. Now, that's interesting in the Lord, isn't it? So, the Lord just kind of loved this David. <laughs> Can I hear an amen? amen. Now, there were three levels of anointing that came upon David's life. Are you enjoying this word, by the way? Okay, stay with me. Stay with me. This is not a short word, but it's a God word. We don't need to be in Pellet Road until 5 o'clock anyway. So, this is one or the other grab right on the way out there. Anyway, hallelujah. You know, I, I mean, you know, they, they, come to, they come to Jesus, and the people need to be fed. And what does Jesus say to the disciples? He said, my food is to do the, one, the will of the one who sent me. That's right. I think in the end times, we're going to have a completely different viewpoint of food. Mm -hmm. And I believe there's going to be people that don't eat for days, weeks, and months that are completely sustained by the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. Because they're eating spiritual food. Mm -hmm. And that spiritual food is nourishing them not only spiritually, but also physically. I'm just going to leave that at that in the Lord. But that God said, release that in the atmosphere. There were three anointings that came upon David. Can you feel the next level anointing of the Lord in the room? Yeah. There's such a freedom to preach the, the word in this room right now. There's such a freedom to teach. And I can feel when, when I'm preaching, I can feel when the word hits people and bounces right back to me. I can feel when it bounces off strongholds. I can also feel when the word just soaks. And when the people hearing the word, when this body is pulling on what God is releasing. I feel a pulling today. Yeah. This is good. This is God. This is next level stuff. Okay. Holly. So if I just go out in the Holy Spirit, my notes are right here. Somebody just jump right in. Okay. We're at the bottom of page one. Page one. Yes, page one. Hallelujah. There were three levels of anointing that came on David's life. The first level came when he was 17 years old. You know what that tells me? God's about to do a mighty work in teenagers. That's what God, uh, that's what that tells me. You know what that also tells me? God's about to do a mighty work in teenagers at heart. Any of those in the room? Okay, now I want you to grab a hold of this. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 4, and I'm not going to take us there. The first level anointing came upon David when David was anointed as king by the prophet Samuel. Now I want you to understand something. David is 17. He's not going to become king until he's in his 30s. See, we got to understand this. Horn of anointing oil, horn over David. You are now king. Samuel walks away and Jesse goes, now go back to the sheep, boy. See, sometimes God puts a, a fresh anointing on your life and he says, okay, now go back to the secret place. They're like, but, 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 but. go back to the secret place. Because you're not ready for this. And if I gave it to you now, you'd mess it up. Okay? You gotta go. Uh, you gotta go back to school, boy, is what he said to David. Now that first level anointing comes upon him, and what happens? He kills the lion and the bear with his bare hands. The second level of anointing that God puts upon him is at age 25. At age 25, God anoints him to be king over the tribe of Judah. Mm -hmm. Judah means praise. 
God was now giving him the kingdom, but he didn't give him all 12 tribes. He just gave him one piece. But God gives him the peace that means praise. Why? Everything starts with praise. Right. Amen. 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 Come on. Grab a hold of this in the Lord. That sounds like glory. Come on. All right. Anyway. <laughs> okay. At age 30, now he receives the highest level of anointing. It's to be king over all 12 tribes. I want to explain this in just a moment. And because this is so crucial in the Lord. How many are receiving this word? Amen. Okay. Grab a hold of this. Each level of anointing is significant for the battles you're going to go through in that season of your life. Right. Right. You've already heard me say that once, but I want to say it again. So when you receive an anointing, don't get discouraged because it doesn't look like so-and-so's anointing or it doesn't look like the anointing that you feel like you're going to have at the end of the journey. Mm -hmm. Receive the anointing He's giving you right now. God's anointing is perfect. His timing is perfect. And He's giving you exactly what you need Amen. in this season Amen. to overcome. Amen. Amen. See, really, He's going to give you this mantle of anointing so you can grow into it mm -hmm. and then when it's it starts getting a little tight glory, glory. then he's going to give you the next mantle of anointing Power so that you can grow into it and use it and and then you know it's got a little tight in the, in the, in the back here <laughs> and, then, and then another baptism of anointing in the oh, holy spirit yeah. and, and another cloak that you're going to walk in and grow into yeah. in that season. And you're just continually going and growing. Amen. Unless you get offended, bitter, upset, angry, and your, your love wax is cold, and you stop dead in your tracks. Amen. See, everything in the, in the kingdom is made to grow. Amen. It starts with a seed. It brings forth a root. And what God is doing underground is unseen above ground, but it's foundational. Then we see a sprout, yes. then we see a branch, and then we see fruit. Amen. It's a process. Come on. Yes. It's a process. Yes. But we're a microwave generation. I don't want a process. I want it now. God says, no, I'm not going to give it to you now. But I want it now. I'm not going to give it to you now. You know why I don't like a microwave? It warms things up in zones. Doesn't do a whole lot for me. Okay? So if I warmed up, Last night's meatloaf and mashed potatoes and corn, half of it's hot, half of it's medium, half of it's cold. Mm -hmm. right. I can't stand that. Mm -hmm. My wife bears with me. Honey, throw it in the oven. I don't like it in zones. I want it consistent. God's saying, I'm taking you to school. It's not a microwave experience. It's a what? Crock pots. God says, I'm crock potting you. I'm putting in the meat. I'm putting in the carrots. I'm putting in the onions. I'm putting in the broth. I'm putting in the salt. I'm putting in the spices. And I'm plugging you in. Now simmer in my presence. Because I'm going to do this thing all the way through because the good work I've begun in you, I'm going to see it through to completion. Do you receive it? Oh, God, give us a deep word. Oh, give us a deep word, Lord. And there goes my microphone. Hallelujah, they love me in the sound booth, don't they? Holy Spirit, it's full and you don't know what's going to happen with the microphones. All right, hallelujah. Now, let's revisit the three levels of anointing. And if you're willing to listen just a little bit longer, there's a great blessing that's coming. If, uh, if my daughter Whitney from Branson is listening in right now, Daughter Whitney, I just heard the Holy Spirit say, I'm taking you to the next level of anointing. I'm taking you to the next level of anointing. And I saw you walking up into the next level of anointing, honey. So you just take it in the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, the first level of anointing came upon David when he was 17. <laughs> the first level of anointing that comes upon you is to deal with day-to-day -day battles. Listen to this now. Is to deal with day-to-day -day battles. When you get that initial baptism of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is now anointing you with a divine enabling. 
which is another word for the anointing, to do what? Get through the daily battles. Somebody once said that the challenge with being a believer is that it's daily. You ever feel that way? Yeah. But you see, the very first level anointing that God puts on you is just to get through the daily battles. And I'll tell you what, church, if you don't walk in the anointing to get through the daily battles, you're not going to get to the destiny that God's talking to you about. Because the victory comes more in the daily than it does the big things that lie on your pathway. See, when you stand before the Lord, I think many times as believers, we think God is going to roll the holy jumbotron in front of us, right? Older generation knows what I'm talking about. He's going to roll out a very large flat panel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, okay, got it. Okay. And that's what we believe. And, and on it is going to flash all these major moments of destiny in our life. That's what we feel. We're going to go, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think it's going to be that way. I think what God is going to roll on the holy jumbotron, so to speak, is all the little victories that happen on a daily basis. That blessed his heart so much. And I believe the Lord's going to stand in front of the screen and say, now because of that, let me show you this. And here's boom, boom, boom. Because our God understands the battles of the day because he was wrapped in flesh too. So he understood the days where the disciples were complaining and the Pharisees were upset and the Sadducees wanted to kill him. And his mother, you know, didn't want him to go somewhere where he might be hurt. You know, and the bickering and the backbiting and the folks wanting the temple tax. Like, he had to deal with all of that. Come on now. See, the first level is just to help you get through the daily battles. Amen? And sometimes we want this big anointing when we really need to ask for God. Can I have that anointing to just help me get through the daily battles? Because I understand success in you is getting through the daily. Does that make sense? And doing this successfully. See, that was the first. See, David's working in the field. And a lion shows up to go eat the sheep. Oh, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, he prowls like a roaring lion. Mm -hmm. He's not the roaring lion. Mm -hmm. He's the, mas the great masquerader, right? Mm -hmm. But how many know if a shepherd doesn't protect the sheep from the lion, he's not going to have a job for very much longer. Right. Now the bear comes, and, and he's got to protect the sheep from the bear mm -hmm. so the sheep can't be devoured. So the family can't be devoured. So the marriage can't be devoured. So the church can't be devoured. So the finances can't be devoured. So the kids can't be devoured. So the relationships can't be devoured. See, that first level was for the dailiness. One day, here comes a giant, or here comes a here comes a lion. Learn to fight that lion. A couple weeks later, oh, here comes the bear. Well, I, you know, I, I beat the lion, so I think I can take this bear too. Mm -hmm. And then one day that's going to lead to, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that blasphemes the armies of God? Yes. You see, even the, le the, the anointing in a specific level builds as you walk more deeply in it. Because we went from the lion to the bear to the giant, and we're still in level one anointing. Mm -hmm. See, the deeper you press into that anointing and use it, the deeper the anointing gets on that level. Does so anybody start? No, this word's for me. Yeah. yeah, this was a yesterday word, by the way. I had a word for two weeks ready for today. And yesterday, God said, no. God said this word. I love it when God does that. It's always going to be an anointed word. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Now, the second level of anointing comes at age 25. Now, this is interesting. It comes not in the shepherd's field. It comes when his family betrays him and comes against him. If I hadn't been speaking your language yet, I think we're finally getting on the same wavelength. You see, at age 25, father-in-law gets upset with him. Father-in-law gets angry with him and decides son-in-law wants to take my kingdom. So you know what he does? He comes against son-in-law Forgets everything that son-in-law has done for him. Takes his wife, who is father-in-law's daughter, gives her to another man, and then chases David for 13 years all over the countryside. 
Tell me he didn't need a special anointing for that season. See, God takes you through the daily anointing, that first level anointing where you learn to fight the lion and the bear and then the giant, and you go, woo! But you see, the lion isn't your kinfolk. The bear's not your brother, and the giant's not your father-in-law. Come on. I gotta be speaking some last language. Right now I'm preaching better than you're responding. <laughs> so come on. Talk to me, people. See, he wasn't related to anybody in the lion kingdom mm -hmm. other than the lion of Judah. You see, now that he's coming off that first level and into the second level, now his own family is betraying him. That's a whole nother level. And when you start going, okay, God, I want to do what you really want me to do, that's when family starts going, uh-huh, uh -huh. what, yeah. uh, you're going to do what? God's called you to what? You're going to what, church? You're going to what? You're going to do what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And family starts coming against you. That's a whole other level of warfare. Mm -hmm. Even Jesus' mm -hmm. ministry was not accepted by his own brothers mm -hmm. until way later. I mean, they're saying to him, oh, Jesus, why don't you go up to the feast? Just reveal yourself. Show them who you are. Jesus, go show them that you're Messiah. Go for it, Jesus. And what does Jesus say to his brothers? You guys go, any time is good for you. That's what he says. Yes. But I have to stay in the timing of the Father. Right. Mm -hmm. You see, on that second level, family doesn't understand what's happening because now you've gone from it just being a Jesus thing to a Jesus and you thing that's going to change your life thing. Amen. Mm -hmm. And now family's going, what? You want to go to church every Sunday? What? No. You want to go to what conference and what city? No. You want to be a missionary? No. You want no, no. What's happened to you? That that little bit of Jesus going to church stuff in goody two shoes, that worked for us, but this? No. No, we're going to have an intervention Monday night, 7 o'clock. Whole family's going to surround you, and we're going to beat the Jesus out of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. Come on. Amen. But you see, they don't understand what God's doing in you. That's right. Husband may not understand. Mm -hmm. Wife may not understand. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say this in love. Who is your first husband? Right. Amen. It's Jesus. That's right. Now, I'm not advocating anything weird. I'm just saying Jesus is your first husband, ladies. I'm saying, men, Jesus is your first husband. He's your first marriage partner. So we've got to understand that. That's why God wants to bring husbands and wives together into a place of unity and agreement where Jesus is both of their first loves, where Jesus is both of their one things, and then Jesus' decrees aren't a problem. Now, if there's unequal yoking, our God saves, our God heals, our God delivers, our God takes to the next level. Yes. Because I am pro-marriage, and I believe that God can do a miracle in any marriage. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So you keep praying for that spouse. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Did I step on anybody's toes with that one? Praise okay. God. okay, well, praise God. All right. So that second level was to, to deal with family because family was now coming against him. And by the way, strangers can hurt you, but family can hurt you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because family should know better. Family in the natural and church family. Amen. That's right. See, both groups should know better Amen. and love us unconditionally. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why that hurt can go deeper than anywhere else. Come on. Come on. All right. But you know, that wasn't the final anointing. But that anointing was the anointing God gave him when the tribe of Judah, his tribe, was going to raise him up as king. You see, when he killed the lion and the bear and the giant, the spirit of God came upon him mm -hmm. in that level. In level two, do you know what came upon him? Praise. In level two, you learn how to praise. And when the battle starts, you start shiria baba, holia da shiria, hallelujah, God, what are you going to bring out of this one? Oh, hallelujah. 
Shiria Baba, -ba we maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Watch this move up. My God, that is who you are. Hey, hey, hey! <laughs> because when he became, grab a hold of this now. Yes. When he became king, he wasn't just leading a group of sheep. And he wasn't just fighting warfare in his family. Now he was leading an entire tribe. And he needed a new level of anointing. And it was a breakthrough anointing called what? Praise! And if he didn't learn how to praise in the second level of anointing, he was never going to make it to his full prophetic destiny, being king over all 12 tribes. And if you won't learn praise on level two, you're not going to get to that big picture destiny that you know that he's called you to. Because praise brings the victory. That's why we need, amen. Praise is a weapon. See, that's why when David comes to Ziklag, where he should have never been living anyway, because he was disillusioned and serving a Philistine king and doing all these things and was about to fight against his own people, his own prophetic destiny, until a you know, Philistine king pointed him out and said he's not going into battle with us. David comes back to Ziklag with all of his mighty men, and the village is burned. Wives and children are gone. All the plunder from the previous season is gone. And his men have a great idea. Let's take our fearless leader whom we love and protect in battle and who means everything to us, and let's stone him. Mm -hmm. But what does David do? He encourages himself in the Lord. That's right. Amen. What did he do? He praised. Yep. Yep. Throw a stone at a man going, Shiria Baba, Hariya Shiria. It'll bounce off. See, you start praising while the enemy's slinging, and you're like holy Teflon. Amen. Come on. Do you get that? Amen. See, David had to learn how to praise. How do you receive that in the Lord? That's why so many psalms, so many psalms are praise psalms. Can I hear an amen? amen? All right. So at age 30, God gives him the third level of anointing. Are you ready for this? The third level of anointing in his life anoints him to rule and reign. See, level one, you're not, you're not ready to rule and reign yet. You're just learning how to fight. Level two, you're just learning how to praise. Mm -hmm. But once you've learned that the battle is the Lord's, and it's not by might, and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord, level one, and you graduate into my praise is a weapon, then God takes you into ruling and reigning. Do you see the progression? Mm -hmm. Everything in the kingdom is a progression. Like baby to toddler to preteen to teen to young adult, to adult, to middle-aged, to gray-haired saint. Amen. Everything. Amen. Amen. Everything is a process. Yes. Right. Servant, mm -hmm. to friend, to son, to bride. Okay. Hallelujah. Somebody say God's good. God's good. Okay. Now grab a hold of this. At age 30, he gets the anointing to rule and reign. Grab a hold of this because he did not give up, but did it God's way. It was the anointing to conquer the Philistines. Now grab a hold of this. David can never rule over the 12 tribes successfully until he conquered the Philistines. Do you want to know what the problem with the Philistines was? Grab a hold of this. He, he beat them in a battle. And they'd settle down and then come back and beat them in another battle. Beat them down. They'd come back. Have to beat them in another battle. They'd settle down. Raise back up again with another army. He'd have to fight them in another battle. It was battle after battle after battle after battle. The third level anointing gives you an anointing to finally rule and reign over things that you were never able to get under control in the other two levels. Addictions, yes. generational bondages, yes. things that you just had to keep 
battling and battling and battling. And you're like, God, I'm not really overcoming it. I'm just keeping it under control till it raises its head up again. And I beat it back down. When am I going to be free from this? When you get the anointing to rule and reign. Now everything gets placed under your feet. There's an anointing in this room right now. Can I hear an amen? amen? You see, it's the anointing to deal with reoccurring battles, reoccurring patterns, and reoccurring thoughts, and re repetitive issues in your life. God, I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. Oh, God, I can't believe I did it again. I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. Oh, God, I can't believe I did it again. I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. Oh, oh wretched man that I am. Where is, where is this God? Where's this freedom that your word talks about? It's at a level that's coming. I'm going to grow you into your freedom. Hey, remember guys, the mentoring group, what did God say to Israel? You're going to go in the promised land. I'm going to give it to you little by little. Little by little, I'm going to give it to you so you can possess it. Because if I gave it to you all at once, you wouldn't be able to possess it all. I'll preach to anybody today in the yes. Lord. Yes. Can I hear an amen? amen. So that final level anointing that David walked in gave him the ability to deal with repetitive cycles in his life and begin to overcome them. Has anybody received this in the Lord? Yes. All right. So we're going to wrap up with this. What do we see in David's life? We see that every level of anointing builds upon the previous. Yes. Not only the anointing itself, but the lessons learned, yes. the maturity gained, yes. the perspectives increased, yes. and the growing up that went with it. Yes. See, I'm going to argue this. You never really leave a level. You take from that level everything you learned and you take it up yeah. with you to yeah. the next one. Yeah. 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 See, that's why when God's that's why when God takes us through things, we shouldn't beat our beat ourselves over the head with it right. and think it disqualified us from what God's called us to. Mm -hmm. No, it was part of a level, and now God's taught you that, and you're not gonna do that again, are you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're stronger, and when God brings right. you back into right. that next level. You just wait. You just wait. Can I hear an amen? amen? Okay. So we've got to understand this in the Lord. Now, what does this look like in our life as we're wrapping this up? Number one, when, when we get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's level one. It's amazing, isn't it? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit will give you what we like to call in Missouri, where all my family's from. The baptism of the Holy Spirit gives you an unction. Right. The baptism of the Holy Spirit gives you an unction. First John, first John two, verse twenty and twenty-seven. What is an unction? It's an ability to function. An unction is something that inspires you or keeps you moving forward. Right. And I hear an amen? amen. I want you to notice something here. Romans chapter eight and verse twenty-six. Don't, don't check out on me yet. Don't start thinking about, you know, the buffet or whatever else. Maybe you got a potluck. Don't start thinking about the potluck. No, I don't want you to stay with me, okay? Romans chapter 8, verse 26. I want you to notice what the Word of God says here. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us and gives us an unction with groans and words that cannot be expressed. And he who, seeks, he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. See, we get baptized in the Holy Spirit and a lot of times folks get with that the gift of tongues. And now things are going on that we don't understand and all of a sudden our spirit starts going I don't know if I believe in that, Pastor. We'll just spend some more time with the Holy Ghost and watch what happens. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. See, that's that's the base level. The, the tongues of fire come in the upper room, and what do they do? They start speaking in tongues. Can I hear an amen? amen. Now, I want you to notice something in my NIV. In that same way, the Spirit helps us 
in our weakness. Somebody say helps us. Helps us. Oh, God's good, isn't he? Amen. Now, that word help in the Greek means to take hold of together with you. Um, wait a minute now. In that same way, the Spirit takes hold of together with you in your weakness. You see, the Greeks called the Holy Spirit the paraclete. Mm -hmm. Paraclete meant the one who is always by my side. So Paul says in the book of Romans, which is about his deliverance, he said, when I'm in the midst of things that I don't understand, when I'm weak, the Holy Spirit lays hold of what I'm dealing with with me. Amen. 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 Right, is that not cool in the Lord? Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. God's good, isn't he? Yeah. Now, here's what's interesting. This word, weakness, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Other translations uses the word infirmity. But the Holy Spirit helps me in my infirmity, my weakness. That infirmity can be moral, spiritual, physical, mental. But what happens? In the midst of it, God is giving you the anointing to stand with Him. And in your weakness, He is strong. Amen. See, that's the base level. You're dealing with the daily stuff. I don't understand the things I want to do. I don't do and the things I don't want to do. I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. That's in your face every day mm -hmm. in the base level. Yes. But you see, as we overcome, God takes us to the next level. But we don't overcome. He really overcomes through us. He helps us. Yes. <laughs> Is that not good? See, it's not your flesh. It's not your power. Less than any of us should boast. Okay. Now, that second level of anointing, I call that the Judah anointing. That's the praise and worshiping anointing. It's anointing and praise and worship in the midst of what you're going through that just won't stop. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> you know what's really interesting? When that anointing comes upon preaching, that, that level two anointing, it's amazing. I've been in church services where pastors will preach for half an hour and it feels like three hours. Yep. I've been in services where someone is preaching for three hours and it feels like 30 minutes. Sometimes in this house, people come and say, Pastor, I can't believe what time it is, but wow, I, I had no idea it was that late. See, that's an unction in the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Come on. That enables you to, to receive that word. And you get lost in what God is saying. And, and the time that normally bothers you or manages you, it doesn't anymore. Because we're in a different realm in the spirit. I was at a teaching one time by a Jewish professor who taught at Moody. He taught the book of Daniel from 8 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. We took a quick break, lit, break, late. We took a quick break for lunch and a quick break for dinner. Literally. Sat in that teaching literally all day long. At 8 o'clock at night, and he's wrapping up. I'm like, wait, 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 hold on, there's more. I'd sat in that teaching for 12 hours, and it felt like 12 minutes. That's an anointing of the Spirit. That's an anointing of a new dimension in the Lord that takes you into a place where you can stay in His presence like you can't in level one. See, I mean, level one, you're shidi ababa, kodi ababa, handi ababa, shidi ababa. Half an hour in, you're like shidi ababa, amen. Man, that was a great time in the Lord. And it was! But in level two, you're shidi ababa, kodi ababa, handi ababa, shidi ababa, kodi ababa, ababa, ababa. Two hours, shidi ababa, shidi ababa, we just got here. You know what I'm saying? It's a place where you get lost in the Spirit. New folks will come here sometimes and go, wow, you guys really praise and worship for a long time. Once folks come and really get in that level two anointing, they're like, can we have another song? Yeah. You know, can we get that just ended too quick? And you'll catch me doing that. You know, we'll do storms, and storm just goes, glory! And it's like, mm -hmm. Can we play another song? I'm not ready to come out yet. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm like in the spirit realm. I'm in the throne room. Can, can you do another song up there, please? Mm -hmm. The ladies know what I'm talking about. The song. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's just letting you know, man, you're in that level two place. Can I hear an amen? amen? Okay. So now stay with me as I wrap up with this. My daughter Hannah always says, you say you're going to wrap up like three times before you wrap up. But the third level of anointing, 
Isn't it interesting? David's name means beloved of God or God's beloved. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Amen? Now, it's an anointing to reign over the 12 tribes. Now, God took a man named Jacob and out of Jacob, he began to fulfill a promise that God gave to Abraham. Remember, Abraham is basically the son of an Armenian. And his dad was basically <laughs> a priest in the temple of a false god, is basically what he is. Do you know what God says to Abraham? You've got to get out of your homelands. I've got to take you to a new place because connected to Papa, you aren't going to be able to be what I've called you to be. I'm calling you away from mom and dad and I'm calling you into a new land. God gave that word to some folks not long ago. Mm -hmm. I'm calling you out of the house of Papa mm -hmm. and I'm calling you into a new place. Mm -hmm. Right? Because you have gained what you needed to gain. Now we're going to a new season, a new anointing, and a new place. Can I hear an amen? amen. So God looks at Abraham and he says, I'm going to make a mighty nation out of you. I don't believe God just spoke that prophetically. I believe he looked into Abraham and saw Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes. I believe he looked into him. Amen. Come on. Well, the word says Levi tithed the Melchizedek. Levi didn't tithe the Melchizedek. Abraham did. Oh, wait a minute. Levi tithed to Melchizedek because he was in Abraham when Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. See, is anybody catching this? Yeah. It's one reason why God wants to take you to a place because your ceiling is going to become your kid's floor. But that's a whole other message in itself. But I believe you looked into Abraham and saw Isaac and Jacob and Judah and Issachar and Zebulon and Benjamin and Ephraim and Manasseh and Joseph, the prince amongst his brothers. I, I believe he looked into him and he saw Abraham behind him. The plume went like this. It's the same thing God sees in you when he talks to you about the ministry he has for you. He sees you in a plume behind you of all the people that he wants you to reach. That's why he went to a man that had no children with a wife who was barren and said, I'm going to make a mighty nation out of you. In the natural, you go, there's no way that's possible. That's why God's plan for your life, if in the natural, you can go, oh yeah, that's possible. I doubt it's from God. There's always an element of the impossible in anything God's going to call you to, even change in your own life. That's why he sends the paracletes. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Okay. It's interesting that if you look at the stock that came out of Abraham, it gets really interesting. You know, Abraham has a problem telling the truth. He lies and he says, you know, his wife is his sister. Isaac does the same thing. By the time we get to Jacob, his name just flat out means deceiver. Houston, we have a problem. But you see one night, when Jacob is trying to get things right with his brother, he goes to sleep in a field. And as he goes to sleep in a field, a man comes and he wrestles with that man all night long. By the way, that man was the Lord. You can argue, well, it's an angel. Well, the word says the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is usually Jesus manifesting in the Old Testament. So he's wrestling with the Lord Jesus, so to speak, out in the field all night long. You want to know the interesting thing about that wrestling match? He wouldn't let the Lord go. You think of two men wrestling, one man's going to pin and the match is over. The man that Jacob was wrestling all night long, he wouldn't let go because he knew there was something about that man. In fact, he wasn't going to let go until the man blessed him. Tell me he didn't have an idea who he was wrestling. You know what? I've been wanting to see you all my life. Now I'm going to put the hammer lock on you and I'm not going to let you go until I encounter you the way I've always wanted to encounter you. And the Lord's like, I got to go. He's like, I'm not going to let you go. Well, I got to go. I'm not going to let you go. Well, I got to go. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And what does God do? God changes his name. And God changes his name to Israel. Can I hear an amen? amen? Now, stay with me because this is interesting. He changes Jacob's name to Israel. So Jacob, in the Hebrew language, there is no J. 
We put J in the Hebrew language because we have a J and it works for us. Jehovah was not the actual name for God in Hebrew. There is no J in Hebrew. It's Yud. U-D. So Israel wasn't really Israel. It was Yudsrael. Jacob really wasn't Jacob. Jacob was Yudkov. Isn't that interesting? Joseph really wasn't Joseph. He was Yusuf. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. There was a name that Israel had for God that they wouldn't even say because it was so holy. Mm -hmm. And it starts tying into some uniqueness in the Hebrew alphabet like that that I'll talk about here in just a moment. Now this is interesting. God says your name's no longer going to be Yudkub. It's going to be Yisrael is what your name is going to be. Now, I taught for years from the pulpit that Israel means wrestles with God. After more research, I found out that I wasn't completely correct. You want to know how awesome God is? Now, Israel's is God's chosen people, right? Yes. Okay. Israel starts with an I. I in the Hebrew alphabet is literally the Yud that I was talking about. U-D, you'd pronounce it Yud. So Israel would be Yudstrael is really how you would pronounce that in Hebrew. Yud or I is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Isn't that interesting? God would name his people a name that begins with the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. How many know God does things intentionally? Can I hear an amen? amen. Now the L in Israel is the, 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 the name Israel ends with is the Israel word Lamed. And it's literally the biggest word or letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Isn't that interesting? Israel starts out with Ud, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and it ends with El or Lamat, the biggest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Meaning what? Israel, though you start out little, in the end, you'll be the biggest nation on the planet. Amen. Oh, yeah. Isn't that interesting? So Jerusalem really isn't Jerusalem. It's Yudselim. Isn't that interesting? Because there's no J in the Hebrew alphabet. Now, are you ready for this? Remember the Hebrew alphabet? I've taught on this a little bit. The reason why the word was so difficult to translate that was written in Hebrew, because Hebrew is a three-dimensional language. Every letter has a sound meaning, a picture meaning, and a musical meaning. That's why the Psalms are so musical. Most of them were written to be sung. Isn't that fascinating? Now, are you ready for this in the Lord? This is so fascinating in Him. Isn't God amazing? Yud, in Hebrew, the word picture or picture picture of Yud is hand. It means hand. So when God says you'll no, you'll no longer be called Yudsif, you'll be called Yisrael, he's really saying, my hand is upon you, Israel. When he says Yudsalem, he's saying city that has my hand on it. When he said Yudsif for Joseph, Prince who has my hand upon you. Isn't that interesting? When I was reading that, I said, Lord called me you, Drew. Hallelujah. All right. So isn't that interesting? It's also interesting that Jehovah is not Jehovah, it's Yudava or Yudhova. Isn't that interesting? as we're studying the Hebrew language. So when we start looking at God's covenant name, so holy that the Israelites wouldn't even pronounce it, yod heh vav -Heh, right? Which is where we translate the word Jehovah. Are you ready for this? The Yod 
is actually Yud. So we would literally pronounce God's name in Hebrew, Yud, Hey, Vo, Hey. The Yud then is that same letter that's the, that we use for Jerusalem, for Joseph, for Jacob. What does that mean? The mighty hand of God is upon everything with Yud attached to it. Is that not beautiful in the Lord? Do so you know what Israel or Yitzrael literally means? The nation who has God's hand upon it that has wrestled and prevailed. Do so you know what the third level anointing really does? It's an abiding anointing that's rubbed into you that gives you an anointing to prevail when you wrestle against anything. Amen. Whether it's the Philistines addictions in your life, whatever it is, it's your Yud anointing. God hand, God's hand upon you to prevail in whatever you're wrestling against. Oh, and what does Paul say, who was a Hebrew scholar, when he writes Ephesians 6.12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, wickedness in high places. The Lord was really saying, you are you, you are you, Israel. You will wrestle, but you will prevail. That's the third level anointing. Somebody say that's really good in the Lord. Woo, all right. Now, I'm going to close with this. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 For we wrestle Don't tune out on me yet We wrestle not against flesh and blood Can I hear an amen? amen. Paul wrote that in Greek Paul wrote Ephesians 6 in Greek Most of the book of Ephesians in Greek He knew Hebrew, he knew Greek, he knew Aramaic He was well taught Here's the interesting thing There's different meanings for wrestle in the Greek there were two men wrestling in a competition. There was wrestling that went on in the Olympic Games. But in the Greek, there was also a wrestle that led to death. So in some of the Greek exhibitions, two men would wrestle each other until one of them was killed. And this is how they did it. They would wrestle, one man would wrestle another man into submission till he got him on his back and he was helpless. Then as the crowd watched, he would stand over the man like this. He would reach up in front of everybody, grab a hold of his windpipe, and rip it out of his throat. I, I can't make that stuff up. Okay? When Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, the word he used for wrestle was wrestling to death. But he saw us as the one standing over the fallen foe and tearing out the windpipe. When he's saying we wrestle against principalities, powers, and wickedness, how do we wrestle like that through the blood of Jesus? Now here's what I really want you to grab a hold of. We've been talking this whole message about the anointing, right? In the Word, the anointing is pictured in one way with oil, right? Okay. So if a coach really had a wrestler that he liked back in the Greek days, that he wanted to make sure was not the one that got his windpipe pulled out in one of these competitions, do you know what he would do to protect the wrestler? For six months prior to the event that would lead to someone wrestling to their death. Every single day he would rub olive oil on the windpipe of his wrestler. He would also send the wrestler into saunas that they had back then, put the oil on, put him in the sauna, have him come out, put the oil back on, would do it every single day for six months because they'd know in advance before these competitions happen. 
would oil that windpipe to the point that the oil literally became part of the skin. He would massage it in so that if that wrestler was in the unadvantageous position of having the foe over him, the foe would go to grab the windpipe and the oil would make his hand slip off. That's a picture of the third level anointing. It makes you slippery. So when the enemy comes and what he's been able to grab a hold on you in the past, he just, his hand just slips off now because you're walking in the third level anointing. You're walking in the Masak. Somebody say, praise the Lord! You see, in the third level anointing, the enemy can't get his hands on you anymore. Because you are slippery with the anointing oil of the Lord. Can I hear an amen? amen? Hallelujah. One more passage. Isaiah 10, 27. Isaiah 10, 27. Are you encouraged by this word today? Amen. I declare over you whatever level of anointing you're in right now, you're about to go to the next level anointing. Do you receive that in the Lord? Amen. Huh. The word says in, in ooh, oh, <laughs> Isaiah 10, 27, In that day their burden will be lifted from your shoulders and their yoke from your neck. The yoke will be broken because you have grown so fat. What's another way to say to this? To say this, there's an anointing that breaks the yoke. And I declare that God is putting that anointing over you and you're going to be so slippery that the old yokes that once fit will now slip off of you in the name of Jesus. So I want you to take a moment. Just close your eyes, if you will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, there's an anointing that's in this room right now. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, I just ask right now that you release your anointing in this room. Lord, I ask that your anointing that has been upon this room all message long would now manifest like never before in this place. Lord, I ask right now, God, that anyone who's on level one, that you would move them into level two in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I just declare right now, God is taking you to a whole nother level of anointing. I speak right now, God's releasing an anointing that breaks the yoke over you. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I speak an outpouring of the anointing of the Lord. Oh, I declare God's taking you to the third level right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in the name of Jesus. Oh, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and my cup overflows. Oh, Lord, prepare a table before her in the presence of her enemies. I declare that third level anointing over you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just speak a pouring out of that third level anointing right now. Woo! Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Woo! I speak an anointing to go to the next level. I speak an anointing to go to the next level. Woo! I speak an anointing to break the yoke. And Lord, I speak an anointing to break the yoke of what Holly and I saw yesterday. Lord, an anointing to break the yoke off of Catholics. An anointing to take your people to the next level. I speak a release of that anointing to rule and reign in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hi, Yusuf. Hallelujah. Shiria baba, shiria baba. Oh, I speak an anointing to go to the next level. I speak an anointing. 
Woo! to go to the next level. Lord, I speak a fatherly release of anointing right now over Natasha, Lord God, to take her to the next level. Woo! Woo! In Jesus' name. Lord, I speak an anointing to go to the next level. Lord, I speak an anointing to go to the next level. Lord, I just speak that anointing to go to the next level. Lord, I speak an anointing of fire to rule and to reign, to overcome. I just speak an anointing right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, an anointing of fire. Lord, I declare that you're giving Gina an anointing to go to the next level. Lord, there's been betrayal. There's been difficulty. There's been challenging things on level two. God, take her to level three. Lord, take her to level three. Lord, I speak that level three anointing right now over your people. Lord, I speak that level three anointing, that anointing to rule and reign. Lord, if somebody's never had your baptism, may you release your baptism in this room. Lord, if someone's on level one, take them to level two. Lord, if they're on level two, take them to level three. Holy Spirit, I just ask for a greater release of the anointing. Greater release of the anointing. Whoo, over every person in this place, Lord. Shiriaba Kodriaba Shiriaba. Hiriaba Shiriaba Kodriaba Hariaba Shi. Lord, release that anointing. Lord, release that anointing. Shiriaba Kiriaba Shi. Lord, release that anointing. Shiriaba Kodriaba Shi. Oh, Taylor, I heard the Lord say during the word today, I heard the Lord say, The places I've taken you before were just a foretaste. The Lord says, I have greater things for you than your eye has seen, ear has heard, or mind imagined. I hear the Lord say today, He said, you've not been disqualified. God says, I have more for you than you've ever imagined. He says, I have more. He says, I'm going to take you to levels you never even dreamed of. I'm going to take you to a place you never got to and close to before. God says, get ready. The latter glory is going to be so much greater than the former glory. And I just bless you, daughter, in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, I thank you for the need. Lord, take him to the next level of anointing. Lord, take him to the next level of anointing. Lord, take him to the next level of anointing. Lord, I ask for that overcoming anointing. Oh, over my son, over Gio, Lord God. Lord, not only the anointing to overcome in the daily, but Lord, the anointing of praise. Lord, I declare you're taking Gio to the next level. Yes, Lord. Lord, I declare you're taking Miss Mia to the next level. Lord, that trip to Africa was just a foretaste of what you're about to do. I speak right now a deeper level of anointing over you than you've ever walked in before. In the name of Jesus, I speak that release of anointing over you right now. Whoo, hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Lord, I speak over Jean that deeper, deeper release of anointing. Wow. Do you just feel that wave of anointing come through the room? Whoa, I speak an anointing over you to write bestsellers. I speak an anointing over you to give prophetic books to the body of Christ to prepare them for his return. I speak a third level anointing over you to rule and reign in Jesus' name. And I speak the anointing to break the yoke is coming over you right now and yokes are slipping off. And I speak the anointing over your throat in the name of Jesus. Woo! To speak the word of the Lord. Woo! And I speak every yoke put around your throat to keep you from speaking is broken through the blood of Jesus. I command man's yoke put on your throat, generational yokes, yokes of the enemy to keep you from speaking. I command those to break in the name of Jesus right now. And I speak the words of the Lord will come through you freely now. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. 
Oh, God, I ask for a third level anointing to come over these two. Lord, you said I'm taking them out of a familiar place and I'm bringing them by a way they've never been before. And God, you brought them here on that word. And in the name of Jesus, I just speak life over these two right now. I speak health over these two right now. I speak healing over these two right now. And Lord, I declare you're releasing the Messiah the rubbed in oil and the anointing for them to rule and reign in the name of Jesus. I just bless you in Jesus name. Yes, Lord. Oh, the Lord said, I'm not done. More, more, more. Lord, I ask that waves of anointing will come over me. Uh, I ask for more, God. I ask for more, God. I ask for more, God. Waves of anointing in Jesus name. Anointing to heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons. I speak release of the anointing in Jesus' name. Woo! Hallelujah. Lord, I just thank you for everybody in this room. Lord Jesus, I ask now for a release of anointing to come over our virtual family. Lord, I thank you for everyone who listens in, Lord God, to this message. And Lord, I ask that you will release over them the third level anointing. If they're on the second level, Lord, the second level anointing, if they're on the first. Lord, I ask God that a fresh baptism will come over them. Lord, fresh fire will come over them. Fresh power will come over them. Lord Jesus, I just thank you right now that you are, Lord, an all-consuming fire. Lord, it's getting warm in this room. Lord, I ask God that that fire will be poured out over this body like never before. Lord, I thank you there's an anointing that breaks the yoke. Lord, release that anointing over us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. And everybody said. Thank you, Lord. Did it just go up about 15 degrees in this room? Woo! Oh, hallelujah. You know, somebody once said, some things are more caught than taught. And I just declare over you today that you caught things <laughs> and you are taught things. And in the name of Jesus, I just decree and declare you're going to flow in both. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I know it's getting late. I, I know that some have to leave and totally understand that. For those who are able to stay, we're going to do two things. We're going to have a potluck in just a little bit. Um, but also, I'm going to have Mia come up. She was just on a missions trip to Africa. Amen? And for those who are able to stay, um, she's going to talk to us a little bit here about her trip to Africa. So if you're able to stay, please stay. We understand if you have to go. But Mia, I'm going to ask you to come up. I've already heard some of the stories. Very exciting about what God did on the trip. But this house helped invest in her trip uh, financially some, but also in prayer. So it's really, really exciting to get to hear her testify of what God did in Africa. So I'm going to move stuff out of the way. All right. Hallelujah. Um, thank you for the opportunity, Pastor Andrew, to share. And thank you for the prayers and the support that I received here uh, while I was on this trip. Um, it was um, very, very helpful. And I'm so thankful for um, the opportunity that God allowed that God allowed me to go. Um, um, <coughs> the support, um, the support of prayers and, and finances uh, really, really helped me. I felt the presence of the Lord. Um, it seemed like this whole message that Pastor Andrew was speaking of today kind of really explained some things that I have been experiencing, um, especially um, uh, before during and after Africa, <laughs> during and post Africa, um, about going into next levels and why 
uh, I have been battling and experienced certain things. Um, they, 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 they were levels of warfare, but I, I'm thankful that the Lord, uh, as he spoke, I'm thankful for the breakthrough <laughs> that God is giving, has given, and is continuing to give right now. Um, so my name is Mia, for those of you who um, do not know me, um, and um, I re just returned as Pastor Andrew explained from a trip from Zambia uh, through a mission trip through an organization called Overland Missions. And Overland Missions um, has several base camps located in, um, in, in various nations like Zambia, Madagascar, Cambodia, and um, they recruit full-time missionaries as well as um, short-term missionaries. Uh, this was a short-term trip to Zambia that I recent, recently attended, and I returned August 14th. Um, and this is the first time I've gone, and I experienced, I don't think I've ever experienced so much in my life, um, physically, spiritually, in every way, in two weeks of my life than I have during this trip. And Zambia really has impacted my life. Um, um, the uh, the missionaries that they have go to come are um, sent out in in the nation that you choose. Um, they would support raise, which which the Lord gave me grace to raise all the, the money and the support that I needed to go. And then they send us out into remote parts of the world where people uh, are less likely to hear the gospel of Christ. So this was a different kind of ministry. Um, I was honored and um, very happy to, to do this, um, though it's a very unique opportunity. Um, it definitely was a change in lifestyle. Um, as we, we went into a village called Silelo in, in the southern province of Zambia, and um, there, um, uh, well, backing up a little, this whole thing started when um, I felt the Lord's leading to purchase a passport. I couldn't explain it. I didn't know why I was feeling to do that. It was in the middle of COVID. So I did the whole, are you sure, Lord, I'm hearing from you thing. <laughs> Nobody told me that I should be going on this trip. Um, in fact, I had the second level um, and I'm still experiencing that second level um, resistance of family and people saying that I should not do what God has called me to do. But I know what God was speaking to me and I um, went ahead and purchased that passport, spent a lot of money um, doing that. And then um, after I did that, I suddenly received a word. I didn't even tell anybody that I got a passport. I suddenly received a word from someone who was praying during a prayer service who said, the Lord's going to send you places you never thought you, you'd go. You will meet people you never thought you'd meet. Um, and so I'm thankful for that word of confirmation. The Lord gave me dreams and visions. And um, suddenly I started to meet other missionaries um, who came to church and Bible studies I was attending to share their testimonies. And they were from Overland Mission. So... Um, as they spoke, my heart would just pound. I felt the call to do this, um, and um, by the grace and directive of the Lord, uh, during COVID, I took a flight to Orlando and to Melbourne, where uh, a conference, where there was a conference um, uh, for the short-term expeditions. And when I arrived, it was like a light came on. It just made sense to me. Um, I completely understood uh, what God was doing at that moment. There we received training. Uh, we literally spent work, time in worship services from morning to night. Uh, and then I, 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 I prayed and asked the Lord, what do I do next? I came all the way here to Florida. I purchased the passport. Uh, I'm here now, what, what's next? Where do I go? And then I was at Chipotle's in Florida and met a couple from Madison, Wisconsin, who invited me to Zambia. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, um, I felt the unction that Pastor um, Andrew talked about. Um, 
to say yes. The Lord said, I felt it like, I know this is weird, but I felt it like behind me, say yes, like the Lord pushed me, say yes. So I said, yes, I will go. And um, moving forward, um, I raised the support by the grace of the Lord. Next thing I know, August 1st rolled around. Um, I went, the Zambian people are uh, very um, humble and honorable, respectful. We were well received. We went as a team of 12 people. And um, in addition, there were some group leaders from Overland Missions who were guiding us through the trip. Uh, because we went to a remote village of Salelo, um, we camped. There were no hotels. There were no. There was no electricity. There. Uh, there was no plumbing. There. Uh, we drank water from a well, and there was a pump. There were no grocery stores. People lived um, a natural lifestyle. They grew their own food. Um, they. They build their own homes. Um, during this time in Zambia, uh, the. Uh, it is. It is winter time, so the temperature during the day uh, was about 85 degrees, that's winter, and then it would drop down to about 50 degrees at night. So since we were camping, well, I was hot during the day, I was freezing at night, but then um, I started to get used to the temperature um, changes, and I thank the Lord for helping me to adapt. Um, I packed the best that I could from very um, cool type of clothing. When I was hot, I carried an umbrella for shade, and I also had a cold weather sleeping bag and a coat, and end up lending out stuff because other people were cold, but the grace of the Lord kept us. And um, we, um, the, the lifestyle of the people that we ministered to, um, um, they, they built their homes out of um, clay and straw, uh, brick and wood, and their homes were not like a building like this that we're accustomed to. There were several structures with different purposes. Um, one kept hens, like a hen house. The other was like a sleeping room with mats. Um, the, the others were um, shelters of some sort. And um, so they had a plot of land and other parts of their land is where they grew their food. Um, and this is what they called their home. So it was very open and outside. And they would say, welcome to my home, but we were, we were sitting outside. So um, most of all of our time were spent outdoors for two weeks, which is um, another uh, difference of, uh, of a lifestyle change for me. Um, a day of ministering in the village was uh, typically about from 8 a.m. to 4 in the evening. Um, we camped in tents. We took turns with camp duties, such as preparing meals for one another and our team and washing dishes. We had a morning devotion. We ate breakfast. Uh, we took a cool bucket bath. There's no running water, no showers. We would go into a bathhouse, take a bucket of water, and um, um, and wash with that. And um, the 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 greatest challenge besides washing with cold water was fighting off goats <laughs> who came in <laughs> and drank my bath water. <laughs> so, so, I mean, this is the reality of, 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 what, of the life. And um, despite that, I'm not complaining. It was one of the most beautiful, natural experiences that I've, I've ever experienced in my life. And um, I, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Um, the beautiful creation that I experienced, um, that, that God has created on that side of the world that um, I was in such awe of during that entire time. Um, but uh, it, it, it was the dry season in Zambia, and it was very dusty, the dirt was red, and so it was a challenge to stay clean. Um, these are just simple things that we take for granted, um, but uh, um, to adapt culturally, uh, we had to go through a little bit of training. We had to learn about culture. We had to learn how to adapt to their way of living before we can burst in there and say, we're going to minister the gospel of Christ. We, we had to change and adapt to, to ways that they could receive us. Uh, so it took a lot of prayer, a little bit of training. So we, um, 
uh, adopted their way of dress a little bit. Today, um, I'm wearing um, what they call the chitangue. This is typically worn by women. Um, it's like a wrap around cloth and used for many purposes. Um, besides clothing, um, women would um, use them to wrap their babies. A lot of times you see uh, ladies now, even in our culture, would use these wraparounds to carry their babies in. Um, they were um, used to carry things and just many purposes. Um, we, we wore these as women, um, uh, men dressed modest so that we adapt to the culture um, and so that they would uh, receive us well. And we attended a, a church service on Sunday. Um, um, the pastor of the church, the local pastor allowed people of our, um, our team to speak um, at the service with interpreters. Um, when we would go break into groups and go out into the village, we would visit home to home. So Zambian culture was that it's acceptable to go to a stranger's home and visit. You just come in and then what they would do is um, stop their work. They were very courteous and very um, accepting. They would have their children or family members um, get some type of wooden um, hand carved stools they would place them in a circle under a shady tree usually, and then um, we would sit down, and then Zambian culture is that they would greet each person in the group. So um, if I were to um, come in and sit down and say, this is your home, um, you, we would greet each other, look at each other individually, and say, Mabuka Buti, um, clapping our hands twice, which means, good morning, how are you? or whatever the time of the day was, we learned, um, quickly learned phrases of the language. We, we had to do a lot of adapting quickly. We only had two weeks there, so if we were gonna be effective with the gospel of Christ, we had to get outside of our culture, our ways of thinking, get in the spirit of the Lord, and be able to effectively embrace the, the mannerisms and cultures of these people and minister the gospel of Christ. And it was the grace of the Lord that they were so open and so receptive to uh, what we were doing. Um, and um, they, um, some of them did not know about the Lord, but many of them did. So we had to quickly assess where people were. The Lord was faithful and just pouring words into me. As we approached each household, house, household, um, I, would, I was suddenly flooded with scriptures, um, things, visions, things that the Lord was laying on my heart. Before we would even approach the house, the Lord was, I'm thankful for how the Lord was faithful to equip us and give us what we needed to effectively minister the gospel of Christ. We had interpreters and you could just see the anointing on them. And um, they also uh, did a wonderful job from morning to night interpreting what we were saying. In Zambia, the um, people who attended school, not everyone went to school, they learned English. Um, David Livingstone from England in 19, I have to go back and study something, early um, century, came to that territory and brought Christianity and the English language. So some many of them in the city of Livingstone spoke English and the villages um, they spoke their own dialects so uh, there's about 75 different dialects in Zambia we learned um, a few phrases of Chitanga which is the dialect of the southwest I mean of the southern province and um, they were very pleased when they heard me say Jesu la cuyanda which means Jesus loves you and the, the look and the expressions on their faces when they could feel the presence of the Lord that I believe that we brought and they heard the words that God loves you in their language. They, the, the looks and the expressions on their faces were like of amazement. They, they just smiles would come on their faces. They were very pleased. When I, I only said one thing, Jesus loved Priyanda, and it was just so powerful. God loves you. That's the simple, first thing of the gospel that that we use and that we taught that I taught people 
when they were learning about the Lord, when they learned the gospel of Christ. So we had to quickly assess where people were because there weren't churches in the village. And then we had to either add precepts or go back from the elementary things of the Lord. We spoke about um, Acts chapter 2. Um, I, I know that um, I won't take long because so much happened. But um, I'll get into the testimonies of some, um, some of the things that happened. We spoke about um, um, the gospel. We spoke about um, receiving the Holy Spirit. We spoke about um, baptism. There were baptisms. There, there were two young men who got baptized in uh, a very nasty, muddy um, water. Did you see? I forgot these pictures were going on behind yeah. me. This was our camp. Um, we cooked and prepared meals. These are some of the, um, the huts and homes. This was our camp. This is where we slept in tents under that big tree. Um, when I, the Lord gave me such a deep connection to these people, uh, when I see their faces, when it was time to leave, um, I literally cried. Um, the Lord just poured into me a love, and that's what he, he gave me to give to these people. He said, go and love these people. Share my word. And that's what that's what I felt from the Lord, and that's what I ministered. So um, um, there were... Um, there were opportunities to minister the word. There was a time when we were ministering the word to a family. We asked them if we could pray with them. They stood up, a woman and her children. Um, we, we spoke about Acts chapter 2 and John 3 when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about the experience of receiving the Holy, Holy Spirit and how he likens it to a wind. And as I was explaining this, we were holding hands about to pray. It was a clear, sunny day. And I, I, I promise you this happened. All of a sudden, a big gust of wind just blew through. As I was speaking those very words that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about the wind, and uh, we were just amazed. Like, leaves were blowing off of trees, and we were just like, whoa. And I was like, do it, Lord. Yes, hallelujah. I was like, confirm the word. The Lord confirms the words of his servant. And um, in that moment, I don't know. I can't really say. Um, I don't want to come here and pretend like. Um, I don't want to give like a flowery testimony. Um I don't want to exaggerate. I don't want to. Um, I, I don't want to. I don't want to misrepresent the the testimonies or the events that took place. Uh, so I don't know if they received the Holy Ghost. I expect that they did um, at that moment. Some of them may have. There was another lady we prayed for. We believe that we did, and that was confirmed by the interpreter. And I, I asked the interpreter. I said. When we were praying for this woman, I saw her her mouth stammering. She was praying. She was engaged in the spirit. Did, what was she saying? And he said, I don't understand what she was saying. So I took that as when we started praying for her, just as the Bible, as they spoke, that the spirit of the Lord fell and that she received the Holy Spirit. That's what I think happened. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to say for sure because I don't want to say something that I don't know for sure but I think that's what happened um, we saw there were um, other people um, a lady who had elderly lady problems with her knees I laid hands on her knees she had trouble walking um, immediately she felt uh, the pain uh, healed and she was able to walk um, there were many healings there. There was a young lady who had problems with her eyes. She belonged to the, she was one of the princesses of the fam royal family, family of the chiefs who moved to that village. Um, so they had the means to go to doctors. She spent five years, they said, under some type of medical treatment that was not effective. Um, many of us laid hands on this young lady, prayed for her. And um, she was able to, uh, like where Pastor Andrew was standing, 
and where I am, they, they held up fingers and said how many fingers she was able to give the accurate amount of fingers that were being held up. Um, so that was an immediate work. I feel like the Lord is still working. Um, like was mentioned during the service, there are seeds that were planted. That's the vision I got before the trip. And they're starting to spring forth under the ground, so I, above the ground. So I feel like seeds are growing. I feel like we harvested some of the seeds that were planted prior to it, before we came, of other missionaries. Um, I, I see the Lord, I definitely saw the Lord working. Um, I'll skip really quickly uh, to other um, testimonies. Excuse me as I reference some notes. Um, there were um, there were times when um, people, a, a, a woman had shared that her child was having nightmares and seeing things in the night. And um, I asked if we could lay hands on, the, if I could lay hands on her, her little boy. Um, Zambian culture uh, is that when we're speaking to adults, um, the, the children out of respect would sit further back. They were not allowed to sit with the adults. Um, and um, women were not allowed to speak in churches. So we just had to accept that's the way it was and do our best to minister the gospel of Christ. So I, I broke a mold a little bit though and just asked, can I pray for your, can I pray for your son? Since she brought him up. So I prayed for um, this little boy and um, uh, there were times that um, where there was a time where a woman, um, she insisted to know about Jesus. We told her more about Jesus. She had heard, she had a very foundational understanding. She had already received the Lord. Um, she had already received salvation. She had a foundational understanding. She wanted more and she demanded that we talk to her about Jesus. And we sat for hours. Sometimes ministering in the village was a short time at people's houses. And then there were times where we sat for hours at a person's house telling them about um, the gospel of Christ. And um, we, um, she, um, she asked prayer for her husband. Um, they were having marital problems. And her husband was attending another church in the village that was not a church of Christ. It was a church of some other type of worship. And since that happened, they started having marital problems, conflicts, and um, seeing dark images in the night and nightmares. So we said, yes, the power, you are to serve the Lord, the Lord only. Um, the power of the Lord is greater than what you are experiencing. We will pray for you. We will pray for your husband. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Um, and no weapon formed against us shall prosper. So we laid hands on this family. Out of my mouth flew tongues. Um, as the Spirit makes intercession for things we don't understand. My spirit was interceding on the behalf of the needs and the spiritual warfare. Uh, against the the portals of darkness that was opened by a member of their family and I believe that the Lord gave victory over that situation um, and that the power of the Lord because of that wife's request and, and prayer and acceptance of the Lord um, I believe that the Lord ministered and pushed back darkness we prayed against a lot of darkness and witchcraft um, it, it's the reality of the ministry of the, the land that we were we were um, in, um, we ministered to one family, and um, um, a, a gentleman and his wife. We started to leave. Another woman comes to run to us and said, "You didn't you didn't pray for me." And we said, "Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were here." So we sit down with her, talk to her a little bit about the gospel of Christ, and asked if she had any prayer requests, and. Um, I, we come to realize that she was the other wife. So polygamy, polygamy was um, a thing um, as well. And um, um, I, uh, we, had, we had opportunity to minister to that. And um, 
we also, um, one, one last testimony I'll share. We got done ministering in the village and um, it was about four in the afternoon and I'm like wiped out. I'm not used to being in the sun like that. I'm hot, I'm usually hot. So um, I just wanted to go in a cool place and, and take a rest. I crawled in, I crawled in my tent and um, um, one of the um, interpreters who was um, a pastor in that village yelled in and said, Mia, there's some people here to see you. So I went out and there were a couple of young ladies and their babies and I had met them prior um, and um, I'm still trying to understand why, why the Lord allowed this to happen but um, I sat down with one of the young ladies there was a picture in there somewhere um, he's sitting at a table with a young lady and um, she wanted prayer for her baby um, so I went to go lay hands and pray for her and just trying to feel what the Spirit is telling me and how I can minister. And Pastor Jerry takes my hand away. Um, he says, no, she's got, um, she's got bracelets on which represent um, idol worship and um, a worship of witchcraft from one of the churches. And, and so he, Pastor Jerry is um, anointed man, powerful in the spirit. His personality type is, is very aggressive and so I kind of felt like in the middle, I had this young lady asking for prayer and then he, he was demanding that I take, sorry, these bracelets off of her. So I just kind of prayed to myself really quickly, Lord, how do I handle this? And um, I did not feel led to start snatching bracelets off of this girl. <laughs> I'm, I'm being honest. Um, I felt that he was correct that we need to, they do need to be removed so that she can fully acknowledge the Lord as her helper, savior, and deliverer, and that idols had to be removed as we do in our culture. And um, so I started to explain to her how much, basically something like how much God loves her, um, he's a jealous God, uh, we are just, there is only one God, everything else is a lie. Um, you need to renounce any type of idols um, in order to receive the healing of the Lord. Um, God does not want you to be hurt or harmed. What you are serving is harmful to you. So God wants you to remove these things out of your life and turn wholeheartedly to, and to serve the Lord because God loves you. And when I explained it, something like that in, in that way she was willing to willingly remove these up chains off of her neck so when I asked her are you ready before I pray for you and before you ask the Lord to heal you and, and the baby are you willing to remove these idols this idol worship out of your life she said yes and I'm going to be honest, a lot of times I'm not used to people <laughs> saying that they're willing to receive the Lord on the spot like that. He, um, she said, yes. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so now um, I tried removing this off her wrist. It, these things were tied, and they were tight. And, um, and I said, these can't be untied. I can't untie these. Um, these have to be cut off. And so I'm like, where, where do I get scissors in the middle of the bush? And then all of a sudden, um, I remembered that I packed a small blade. It was in my bag. <laughs> that amongst many other things that I packed, too many things I packed, it became useful for that moment. Um, I got the small blade out. I figured we're going to be camping, so I might need this blade. And I was able to get it through customs and everything. Uh, check, checked it in a bag. Um, so I used the blade um, to carefully cut this off her wrist. Um, and then I told her through the interpreter, this is how we treat idols. I toss it in the fire. <laughs> so um, um, she, she smiled and she laughed and she, she, um, she, she was agreeable to all of this. Um, I did not force her. I don't feel that the Lord wants us to force conviction on people. I feel that they need to make these decisions in their heart and I felt that she once she decided that she was going to renounce these idols and the witchcraft that she served 
and she was going to receive the Lord, I felt that she was liberated at that moment. Um, so then I, I started to pray for her again. Pastor Jerry takes my hand away. He said, there's more. And I said, oh, okay, I didn't even notice. So she's got one around, uh, another on her ankle, and then there's one around the baby's neck. These things are, whoever did this, they're tight. They're tight around this baby's neck. They're tight around her ankle and her wrist, and they can't be untied. I, 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 I rebuke this in the name of Jesus. This woman will be unshackled in the name of Jesus. I don't care how tight or how well these things are tied on the power of the Lord is going to free this woman. So um, I use my blade, which it's almost like representing the sword of the spirit. Um, I cut it off of her ankle and then um, the baby. I, I felt extremely uncomfortable with the blade around the baby's neck. But what I did was the Lord just gave me wisdom and understanding to slide my fingers uh, between the, I could fit like three fingers underneath between the baby's neck and this chain that they wrapped around this baby's neck. And then turn the knife away from the baby's neck and but digging into my fingers. So I saw it at it and uh, finally it, it broke loose. I tossed those strings in the fire um, and um, all of a sudden when that happened, the Lord gave me a vision of literal chains falling off. When I saw chains falling off, being unshackled from her arms and the baby's neck. Amen. And um, I shared with her what I just saw in a vision and, and it made her smile and she received this. I looked at Pastor Jerry and I was like, now can I pray for her? <laughs> said, yes. I laid my hands and prayed for this girl. So these were the types of things that we we dealt with, the type of ministering that we, we dealt with. Um, there was, um, this is church on Sunday morning. Um, um, Pastor Jerry told us to, um, who was the who was the local um, um, Bible study teacher? Told us as we go about the village to inform the people that there was a a Bible study to be done under the mango tree at 14 hours. They do like a military time, so everybody in the village knew what the mango tree was. <laughs> There's no streets, no street signs. We all met at 2, 2 p.m. Sunday afternoon underneath the mango tree. There, there it was. There's a mango tree. And it was like, um, it, it seemed like 100 people. And this was just word of mouth. We, we, we went to, um, there's some, some kid children I was playing with. They love my camera. <laughs> um, they love pictures. They, they, don't, they don't see this except for us American people who come through every once in a while. This is the ministry under the mango tree. Young lady, my interpreter, I adopted people, I adopted family. Um, some of them live close enough to Livingstone where they can get Wi-Fi connection. There is, um, uh, so some of them have Facebook and WhatsApp. So I was able to maintain connection in that way. This woman's feet were swollen. swollen. Um, some people prayed, they got healed. Um, there was a gentleman named John, I won't be long longer, um, me with my umbrella, because I was hot. Um, um, there was a gentleman named John who was sick. I don't know what he was sick from. I don't think it was COVID um, because we're in a time of COVID, he was shunned in the village. Um, they were afraid of COVID, and um, because he was sick, uh, no one in his family would approach him. Um, no one in the village would approach him. And you can understand why. But because of that, he experienced not only sickness and, and isolation, and um, some missionaries had come through prior to us prayed for him, and he got well, and he said he saw a vision of the way he described it, Jesus in the bed with him. Like the Lord came and visited him on his his sick bed. And like the scripture says, he made all his bed in his sickness and he, he became well. So I looked at this man and, and without him even saying that, the Lord just revealed to me, I said, you have a testimony. You need to share 
what God did, and I and I felt this in, in my spirit. He started talking, and he said, the Lord healed me. And people were afraid of him because of COVID, and some missionaries came through, and were not afraid to pray for him and lay their hands on him, and he got healed. So he was thankful that the Lord sent people to pray for him. Um, there's no doctors. Um, there was a lady with a swollen face. I lost pictures, by the way. Um, I told Cindy, these were pictures that I, I got from other people. Thank the Lord, at least I have these. But there was a, a friend I met. She had a swollen face. Her name was B, the same as my mom. And um, I, I said, well, can you? are you able to go into town to get, get to the dentist? And she said, I have no money. And I laid my hands on her face and pray for her. a couple of days later that swelling was almost all the way down so the lord did healings people received salvation people received the holy ghost um people were baptized um and the nasty water that uh, that the um, animals were drinking out of this showed the level of hunger that the people had and the receptiveness of the gospel of christ so um I'm extremely thankful for this opportunity and I'm thankful for what the Lord has done. Um, I literally experienced on this trip, um, um, there's the scripture that I, um, I literally experienced the scripture that says when we're distressed, but we're not in despair, perplexed. I was looking for it and I wrote it down. Um, perplexed, but um, but but we're persecuted, but but we're delivered. Something to that effect. And I I experienced sickness. I got sick. Um, I was sick for one night and one day. Um, I had fever. I had flu-like symptoms. Um, I couldn't move. Like I couldn't get up. I just wanted a drink of water. And um, I just laid there in the tent um, on my air bed, and I slept from, I got up in the morning about 6 a.m., and I slept till 3 p.m. Um, while I was sick. And they would come check on me, um, the, 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 the team leaders, and get me water. I took some electrolytes. I might have been dehydrated. Um, I, it might have been um, something I ate. Um, but I just laid in there and asked the Lord, God, heal me. Um, um, and the next morning, um, I got up about 6 a.m. And I w it was like I was never sick. I got up. I said, Lord, we got to get out of here. We have to pack up our stuff. It was time to go. We have to get on a flight. I didn't even have energy to get myself a drink of water the day before. When I got up, I asked the Lord to heal me. They laid hands on me. I got up the next morning like it never happened. I had energy. I had strength. I packed up my stuff. I traveled home and I got out of there. <laughs> well, so I thank the Lord for his healing. Um, I was persecuted. Like I said, I wish I can give you a flowery um, testimony. Um, it didn't happen that way. There was the beauty of, of um, and the power of people being saved, healed, delivered baptized there were there was the beauty of all of that there were there was also the the strain that i endured persecution there was doctrinal confusion and disunity so there were times when we were out together we were paired in groups i was literally told not to preach john 3. jesus said um you, except you're born of water and the spirit you cannot enter into the kingdom i didn't realize that saying these scriptures that I felt like the Lord was giving me for several months, that in Romans 15, which also speaks of that. I did not know that would make people angry. I was not trying to make people angry. I um, spoke what the Lord gave me to speak. I spoke scriptures, and next thing I know, um, somehow it went against what people were taught that were present in a group with me, I was told not to share that. But um, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against me will prosper, and I will, will not shun to declare the gospel of Christ. 
um, I will speak his truth. Um, and God, God did prevail. I labored in the dirt. I was in, found a moment to myself while others went off to use a bathroom or something. Um, I sat in the dirt of Salelo Village in Zambia. I cried out to God. I, we, we had a lunch break. I, I had this dirty sandwich. That's what I had to eat. That I, you eat it or you or you don't. I I, I eat egg salad. I don't even eat meat. <laughs> but um, um, you eat or you or, or you or you don't eat. So um, I cried out to the Lord and asked the Lord to um, to minister in that situation and bring deliverance to the disunity, and that we accomplish what He called us there for to do. And um, I prayed this in the hot sun and the dirt of, of, of Zambia. Um, and next thing I know, we went to the next house. We came together as a group. And the power of the Lord just ministered fluently amongst us. It was almost like people were speaking truth against their will. Where prior to this day, they were arguing against me, saying this is not true. Then all of a sudden, against their will, God had his way yeah. and spoke through people and individuals and we were all in unity and we were saying the same thing. So I had to fight and labor and um, and I had to um, warn the spirit before we got to a place where we can effectively minister the gospel of Christ in unity. Um, I had to warn the spirit to be healed. So it wasn't um, a flowery <laughs> testimony like but it was um, the power of God was present and I believe that he accomplished I, what he desired to do through us I hope that I did um, the, the the discernment and the feelings that were uh, uh, in the spirit that were overcoming me that entire time I was just in awe um, we saw the Mosia um, Tunia which is Victoria Falls um, the presence of the Lord was so powerful at the beauty of his creation. I cried and I wept. Um, I felt burden of poverty. People were desperate for us to buy things from them because of the spirit of poverty. I felt um, joy and elation of people getting saved. I, I experienced sickness. I experienced peril. I experienced this was all in two weeks. <laughs> so, um, um, I also experienced when I was sitting in the dirt in the hot sun, a feeling of um, gratitude came over me. Lord, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for um, the privilege to be able to minister the gospel of Christ. Thank you for the powerful way that you delivered me when I cried. I cried unto the Lord and he answered me. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord and he answered me, Psalm 18. Um, that took place during my time there and I'm thankful that the Lord heard my cries and that he ultimately was glorified and had his way despite the, um, the, despite the setbacks and the, uh, what was coming against us thankful for the power and the deliverance that he gave the people. So please continue to pray for these people. Um, God is doing amazing things and um, thank you for listening. Wow. Hallelujah. This video, this was the beginning of many missions. <laughs> humble beginning in the Lord. All right. Hallelujah. All right, folks, it's just about 2.30. Um, we have a potluck.